Well, good evening and welcome to our debate tonight. Uh, my name is Scott Tomlinson. I am the, your evening's moderator. And uh, we have uh, a few people to thank for this. We'd like to uh, first thank uh, Reston Bible Church for allowing this to happen. Um, these two gentlemen, I think, will put on uh, not only a fine show, but a, a intellectually stimulating debate, and we're looking forward to it uh, with great um, anticipation. And I think that uh, this might end up being one of my favorite YouTube debates for this reason. Um, on the one hand is a former atheist who has become a Christian. On the other hand is a former Christian who has become an atheist. Uh, if this were poker, everybody knows the whole cards. So uh, this should be a good debate because no one side can say they don't understand the other side's position. Um, so if you would do me the favor also, of course, of silencing your mobile devices and phones at this point. I'm the guy who's always guilty of that, so I'll mention that right out at the beginning. Uh, and then now let, it, uh, let me introduce our speakers. On my left is Dr. David Wood. David Wood is a member of the Society of Christian Philosophers, the M Evangelical Philosophical Society, and the Hume Society. David is a further, uh, former atheist, and he became a Christian, interestingly, after examining the historical evidence for tonight's very topic, the resurrection of Jesus. He is a contributor to the books Evidence for God, 50 Arguments from Faith, for Faith from the Bible, History, Philosophy, and Science, Defending the Resurrection, and the book True Reason, Christian Responses to the Challenge of Atheism. Uh, David has been in more than 40 moderated public debates, uh, and he runs the website acts17.net, and he lives in the Bronx with his wife Marie and his four sons, Lucien, Blaise, Reed, and Paley. Uh, Dr. Wood is also uh, has some fame as well as being the man who led uh, I've, I've oftentimes in our class here uh, called Solid Ground that, that talks about these topics said, rarely does one argue somebody to another position, but Dr. Wood effectively argued uh, Nabil Qureshi, who works for uh, Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, from Islam to Christianity. So it does happen, and Dr. Wood has accomplished it. On my right is John Loftus, uh, who is a former Christian manager, uh, excuse me, minister and apologist, uh, with three master's degrees uh, in philosophy, theology, and the philosophy of religion from Lincoln Christian Seminary and Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Uh, when at Trinity, he studied under a little-known professor named Dr. William Lane Craig. Uh, and so if this man knows uh, uh, some, one of maybe the premier uh, Christian apologists' data from the inside, this is the man you're looking for right here. And he's a friend of mine. And a friend. Um, and I think John has defended him on, on multiple occasions and occasionally gets some flack for that Just as once. well. Okay. <laughs> He's also studying um, for his PhD, a PhD program at Marquette University um, in theology and ethics. He has authored seven books in the last seven years. He's a busy man. Uh, one of them, Why I Became an Atheist, A Former Preacher Rejects Christianity, The Outsider Test for Faith, The Christian Delusion, and The End of Christianity. And then my favorite, he co-wrote a book with Dr. Randall Rouser, called God or Godless, where uh, both a Christian and an atheist take 20 questions, and both of them answer those questions in that book from each respective side. So it's a good resource, and I imagine is on sale in the back too. Both gentlemen's books are on sale in the back. A Little bit about tonight's debate. Uh, it is a question, did Jesus rise from the dead? Arguing in the affirmative, and who will go first is Dr. Wood. Arguing in the negative is uh, John Loftus. Uh, there will be two 20-minute opening statements, followed by 12-minute first rebuttals following, excuse me, followed by eight-minute second rebuttals, and then we're going to have a 10-minute crossfire question and answer period where each individual will have one minute to say uh, what they wish or ask a question, and the other person to engage with that question and then vice versa. So we'll have 10 minutes, basically five rounds of one, of one minute each side back and forth. After that, we'll have five-minute closing statements, and then after the closing statements, we'll have the audience Q&A. The audience Q&A will be conducted from this microphone here to your right, and if you would be so kind, uh, we'll give some more instructions at the Q&A time, but as we begin to line up for that, let's not begin to line up for that until the end of the last closing statement. I'll tell you when to start lining up for that. Uh, and then we do want to alternate a question for Dr. Wood, a question for Mr. Loftus, one after another uh, each side. And then I'll give, I'll, uh, before that, I'll give a little bit more clarity uh, on those. So without further ado, let me welcome to the podium Dr. Well, good evening. I'd like to thank uh, Reston Bible Church for hosting our debate tonight. 
Resurrection of Jesus offers answers to more of the big questions than any other event in history. Does God exist? If so, does he care about us? Uh, is there life after death? Do miracles occur? Uh, how can we know the true religion? Um, questions like that. And we had our answers to these questions when a group of women showed up at the tomb of Jesus and were greeted by an angel who said, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, he has risen, just as he said. The early Christians defended this proclamation against critics, and it's an honor to carry on that defense nearly 2,000 years later. I'd also like to thank my friend John for representing the atheist position. This is my third debate with John, and his dedication continues to amaze me. I don't think Christians appreciate the sacrifice many of our atheist friends make when they spend so much of their time talking about Christianity. Anyone can understand why Christians want to discuss these issues. We believe they have eternal significance. But for atheists who are convinced that their existence ends in just a few decades, to spend those decades unwaveringly focused on Jesus and the Bible, we can only marvel that they're so generous with the little bit of time they've got. If I didn't know better, which I don't, I might think there's something spiritual going on here. But more on this later. We love you, John. You're a good man, dude. Did Jesus rise from the dead? The short answer, yes. The long answer, yes. <laughs> and having a verifiable miracle at its core is one of the most important differences between Christianity and its competitors. I find it fascinating that atheists dogmatically insist that the message of Christianity is just put your blind faith in our religion. When Christianity, more than any other worldview I'm aware of, has always said, here's how you can know that this is true. In the book of Acts, the apostle Paul says to the people of Athens, tells them that God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So if Christians proclaim, here's the proof, why do atheists here just believe without any evidence whatsoever? It's as if hearing they do not hear and seeing they do not see. But for those with ears to hear, knowing that Jesus rose from the dead is actually much simpler than people realize. To know that Jesus rose from the dead, we only need to know two things. One, that he was dead, and two, that he was alive again later. Uh, if Jesus was dead and he was alive again later, I'd say that our atheist friends have a great big son of God shaped hole in their worldview. I doubt that John and I are going to have any disagreement on whether Jesus was dead because we both study the sources and Jesus' death by crucifixion is one of the best established facts of ancient history. Now, the new generation of atheists who learn about Christianity primarily from websites or social media may be surprised to hear that there are historical facts about Jesus. They think of Jesus as a mythical figure, like Hercules, except that they're much angrier about Jesus for some reason. It's a tragedy of the internet age that positions that would be laughed out of the room at the scholarly level can, be, uh, can become quite popular at the internet level by circulating among people who don't know much about a topic. At the scholarly level, Jesus mythers are thought of as, as along the same lines as Holocaust deniers, but at the internet level, it seems like every other atheist I run into says Jesus never existed. Really? Well, what books have you read on this? None, but I watched like three YouTube videos, so I'm obviously more knowledgeable than every respected scholar on the planet. Meanwhile, even some of the most critical historical Jesus scholars will acknowledge certain facts about Jesus. That he was baptized by John the Baptist, that he had disciples, that he was known as a miracle worker and an exorcist, that he believed he played a crucial role in the coming of the kingdom of God, and of course, that he died by crucifixion. The scholarly consensus on Jesus' death arises from having a variety of ancient sources. There are Christian, Jewish, and Roman sources reporting Jesus' death and knowing how crucifixion works. Today, we tend to think of crucifixion as just nailing someone to a cross, but Roman crucifixion was a three-step process. The first step was the scourging, which was sometimes called the half-death because victims would be half-dead by the time it was finished. The Romans used a flagrum made of leather thongs with chunks of bone and metal woven into the strands designed for removing human flesh. We have records of people being beaten until their veins and arteries were exposed or until their bones were showing or until their intestines spilled out. Julius Caesar remarked, it is more grievous to be scourged than to be put to death. And that was just the beginning. Step two was nailing the victim to a cross and letting him hang there while blood drained out of him. 
Once he stopped gasping for breath, the Romans knew their work was done. Uh, almost. The Romans didn't take crucifixion lightly, so there was a third step, a death blow, just to make sure their victim was dead. If they needed to pry someone off a cross, they would smash his head in or stab him through the heart with a sword or a spear or set him on fire or let wild animals rip him apart. Not the sort of process anyone's going to walk away from. So Jesus' death isn't simply a point of Christian doctrine, it's a fact of history, as even non-Christian scholars are happy to admit. Atheist New Testament scholar Gerd Ludemann declares that Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. John Dominic Crossan of the infamous Jesus Seminar says that there is not the slightest doubt about the fact of Jesus' crucifixion under Pontius Pilate. Marcus Borg, another member of the Jesus Seminar, states that Jesus' execution is the most certain fact about the historical Jesus. Jewish scholar Pincus Lapid concludes that Jesus' death by crucifixion is historically certain. According to Paula Fredrickson, a convert to Judaism, the single most solid fact about Jesus' life is his death. He was executed by the Roman prefect Pilate on or around Passover in the manner Rome reserved particularly for political insurrectionists, namely crucifixion. And as everyone's favorite scholarly critic of Christianity, Bart Ehrman, maintains, one of the most certain facts of history is that Jesus was crucified on orders of the Roman prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate. The real question for us tonight, then, is whether Jesus was alive again. How would we know if Jesus was alive at some point following his execution by the Romans? Same way we know many other things for, from history. We need witnesses, and we need to know that we can trust these witnesses. Do we have witnesses of the risen Jesus? Yes, lots. Fortunately, they began preaching almost immediately, and we have summaries of some of their early sermons. They issued official creedal statements that could be easily memorized and passed on to others. They sent out representatives with authoritative traditions, traditions that would eventually be incorporated into the Gospels and other writings. We also have writings and quotations outside the New Testament from the next generation of Christian leaders, which included people like Clement of Rome and Polycarp, who knew one or more of the apostles and who continued preaching the message of the apostles, especially the resurrection of Jesus. But the most interesting source on the eyewitnesses of the risen Jesus is an early Christian creed recorded in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7. 1 Corinthians was written around AD 55, and Paul says in the letter that he had already delivered the creed to the church in Corinth, which would have been several years earlier. But Paul received the creed long before that, either when he visited the apostles in Jerusalem or perhaps even at his conversion, and scholars date its formulation to within a few years of Jesus' crucifixion. James D.G. Dunn writes, this tradition, we can be entirely confident, was formulated as tradition within months of Jesus' death. According to Michael Goulder, Paul received the tradition, that is, he was taught it at his conversion perhaps two years after Jesus' death. Ulrich Wilkins says that the creed indubitably goes back to the oldest phase of all in the history of primitive Christianity. Gerrit Ludemann maintains that the elements in the tradition are to be dated to the first two years after the crucifixion of Jesus. Paul Barnett dates the creed to within two or three years of the first Easter. Richard Burge and Graham Gould say it dates from only a few years after Jesus' death. Robert Funk and the Jesus Seminar put it within two or three years at most. Richard Hayes says it originates within about three years after Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem, and Alexander Wedderburn asserts that it goes back to the first half of the 30s. So there's widespread agreement among scholars that, from across the theological spectrum that 1 Corinthians 15 contains very early material that goes right back to the original apostles of Jesus shortly after his death. Let's read the passage. Paul writes, For I delivered to you, the Christians of Corinth, as of first importance, this is foundational information, what I also received. Begin creed that Paul received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. Paul is writing this years later, so he adds parenthetically, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. The original would have ended with the appearance to all the apostles. But Jesus appeared to Paul later, so Paul adds, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Notice what we have here. We have Jesus' death for sins, his burial, his resurrection on the third day, and numerous appearances, 
And we have all of it as authoritative tradition within a few years, within, if not within months, of the crucifixion. As for the appearances, there are appearances to individuals, Peter, James, the brother of Jesus, and eventually Paul, to small groups, the 12 and all the apostles, and to a large group. He appeared to more than 500. The list also reports appearances to both friends and foes. Peter and the apostles were followers of Jesus during his three-year ministry, but James and Paul weren't. James didn't believe that his brother was the Messiah when Jesus was preaching in Galilee and Judea, and Paul persecuted the church and tried to destroy it. Yet they're all listed as witnesses who saw Jesus alive again sometime after his death. This passage eliminates two skeptical responses to Jesus' resurrection, um, the legend hypothesis and the hallucination hypothesis. At the internet level, there are still people who claim that Christian belief in Jesus' resurrection arose through a process of legendary development over a period of many decades. But this is factually false. We know as a fact of history that the resurrection was the heart of Christian preaching from the beginning. You also may have heard people argue that Jesus' disciples simply hallucinated the resurrection appearances. But a hallucination, by definition, is something that occurs in the mind of the person experiencing it. If my friend Paul here takes a bunch of acid and a leprechaun appear, appears to him, the rest of us aren't going to ask for his pot of gold because we're not going to see him. It's only in Paul's mind. The leprechaun doesn't exist outside of his mind. So we can't attribute the resurrection appearances to legend or hallucinations. Uh, Jesus appeared to multiple people on multiple occasions. Can we attribute them to deception? Were the disciples lying about the appearances? That's what I thought uh, before I was a Christian. But there's a fatal flaw in the deception hypothesis. Liars make poor martyrs. Some human beings are willing to die for what they believe in. I've never met anyone who's willing to die for something he made up. In the book of Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are arrested and threatened. In Acts 5, the apostles are put in jail and flogged. In Acts 12, James, the brother of John, is put to death by Herod, and Peter is again put in jail. The apostle Paul describes his life as a Christian in 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 12, uh, 24 to 27. He writes, Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep. I've been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. Become a Christian. It's a great life. The Jewish historian Josephus reports that James, the brother of Jesus, was stoned to death as a lawbreaker. Clement of Rome invites his readers to keep in mind the sufferings and martyrdoms of Peter and Paul. So the apostles didn't just preach that they had seen Jesus alive again. They were willing to endure prison floggings and death as they preached. And that means they really believed what they were saying. Here again, it's not just Christians who draw this conclusion. Even non-Christians maintain that the disciples sincerely believed that they had seen Jesus. Gerrit Ludeman, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which he appeared to them as the risen Christ. Bart Ehrman, we can say with complete certainty that some of his disciples at some later time insisted that he had soon appeared to them, convincing them that he had been raised from the dead. Bart Ehrman again, it is a historical fact that some of Jesus' followers came to believe that he had been raised from the dead soon after his crucifixion. Paula Fredrickson, I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus. I'm not saying that they really did see the raised Jesus. I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw, but I do know as a historian, they must have seen something. Fredrickson says she doesn't know what they saw, but I do. I think it's obvious what they saw. The disciples saw the sort of thing that would convince individuals and groups, friends and foes, that they had all seen a man who had been dead alive again, standing in front of them, telling them why he had to die and rise again. Unfortunately for our atheist friends, the only sort of thing that can do that is Jesus actually appearing to them, which means that Jesus rose from the dead. So there's only one conclusion to draw from the facts that even atheists and agnostic scholars grant as historically certain. And yet, atheists and agnostic scholars clearly don't believe Jesus rose from the dead. 
Why do they reject the resurrection when they're aware of the historical evidence? Different people will give different reasons for denying Jesus' resurrection, but if you do a little digging, two broad issues emerge most frequently. First, many people have a prior commitment to naturalism. Supernatural explanations are ruled out before the investigation begins. And if supernatural explanations are ruled out prior to investigation, Jesus' resurrection is never even a candidate for belief. So is a commitment to naturalism a good reason to reject the resurrection? As Alvin Plantinga and others have shown, naturalism as a worldview is fundamentally incoherent because it ends up undermining the cognitive faculties required to affirm it. But a more glaring difficulty, given a discussion of miracles, is the global abundance of miracle claims. In 2006, the Pew Forum issued a report titled Spirit and Power, a 10-country survey of Pentecostals, discussing statistics on Pentecostal and charismatic Protestants in the United States, Brazil, Chile, Guatemala, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, India, the Philippines, and South Korea. And the researchers found that approximately 200 million Pentecostal and charismatic Protestants in just those 10 countries believe that they have personally witnessed miraculous healings. And that's not counting other kinds of Christians in those countries or Christians in other countries around the world. Consider miracle reports in China. According to Edmund Tang, all Christian churches in China practice some form of healing. In fact, according to some surveys, 90% of new believers cite healing as a reason for their conversion. This is especially true in the countryside where medical facilities are often inadequate or non-existent. After reviewing a number of miracle reports from around the world, Craig Keener concludes, it is no longer plausible to tout uniform human experience as a basis for denying miracles as in the traditional modern argument. Hundreds of millions of claims would have to be satisfactorily explained in non-supernatural terms for this appeal to succeed. While many may be so explained, one cannot adopt the conclusion of uniformity as a premise without investigating all of them. In other words, those who exclude supernatural explanations prior to investigation do so by faith, not because the evidence demands it. Second, it's perhaps even more common to reject the resurrection because of what the resurrection implies. If we believe that Jesus rose from the dead, we might think it's a good idea to listen to what he says. But Jesus said all kinds of things about sin and judgment and salvation, and if we don't want to take his teaching seriously, or if we don't want to become Christians, or if we despise anything that has anything to do with Christianity, we kind of need to get rid of that whole rising from the dead thing. Now this has always seemed like an odd approach to me. Decide what we want to believe ahead of time, and then uh, reject evidence that doesn't line up with what we want to believe. And atheists normally condemn this approach. Suppose an atheist comes to you with uh, some kind of evidence, let's say evidence for common descent that all human beings uh, share an ancestor with, with all other organisms. Um, if your response is, well, I don't like what that would mean, I don't like what common descent implies, so I'm going to reject any evidence you give me for it, the atheist will accuse you of being anti-science and anti-evidence and irrational and bigoted and every other thing you can think of. Um, but then if you turn to that same atheist and present historical facts about the resurrection of Jesus, you'll suddenly find that heaven and hell and the Salem witch trials and gay wedding cakes and all kinds of other topics are entering into his evaluation of whether Jesus was dead and whether he was alive again afterwards. Feelings become the ultimate trump card. But if atheists want to bring their feelings about Christianity into a discussion of historical facts about Jesus, keep in mind that this cuts both ways. I have all kinds of feelings about atheism. Now, there's other evidence that's relevant to this discussion, and I'm sure that much of it will come out in the course of this debate. But we already have enough to conclude that Jesus died by crucifixion, that he was alive again later, that friends and foes were so thoroughly convinced that Jesus had appeared to them that they were willing to endure torture and death for the privilege of proclaiming the Christian message. The question for us is, what happened? Uh, that's the question uh, I had to struggle with 19 years ago, and I realized that apart from the resurrection, I couldn't come up with any explanation that fit the facts. By that time, I already knew that naturalism was a theory in crisis, and I didn't trust my feelings enough to deny evidence based on them. In the end, I concluded that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead, and that if I'm going to listen to anyone tell me about God, it's him. Thank you, and now we'll have a 20-minute opening statement by John.
Don't start the timer yet. I'm running the timer, so you're all right. All right. David, David, David. I am literally stunned. <sighs> okay. But I'm going to be nice. If that's all it takes for you to believe that somebody was raised from the dead, then you might just believe anything. You might believe that witches are empowered by the devil and uh, think that they should be killed. You might believe, based on the Bible, that slavery is okay. You might believe that people are going to go to heaven, and so when you're in the crusades, um, not knowing which ones are true believers and which ones not, just say, well, kill them all and let God decide. All right, I'm sorry. i got to get on uh, with my talk. <laughs> I, um, I can't express to you how diametrically opposed we are in our views of things. So let me get on to what I've got to say. You want to put that up? Okay. Um, would you do that line by line, please? Okay. Um, okay. Um, I want you to think in terms of never having heard about Jesus before, never having heard about Christianity before. Now, if you had had that in mind when he started, when he was talking, if you had that in mind the very first time when he stood up and said anything, the very first time he spoke a word. And you were evaluating his case based on never hearing Jesus about Jesus, never hearing about Christianity. You would have the same view of things as I, I do sitting here listening to that evidence. Um, see, most of us are raised to believe what our parents taught us or our uncles or, um, you know, uh, grandparents in a, in a Christian culture mainly. And if you were raised in a Muslim culture, you would be uh, taught differently. If you were raised in a Jewish culture, you'd be taught differently. If you were raised in a Hindu or a Buddhist culture, you would be raised to believe differently. And you would come to a debate like this. And you would hear someone defend your views, just like David did. And no matter what I said as an atheist, you would walk away and say, David just kicked butt tonight. I mean, if you were a Buddhist, you would, you would do that. If you were a Hindu, you would do that. Because you were raised to believe a certain way, and you're looking for ways to support what you believe. You're not actually evaluating the evidence like you should. Dead people don't rise up from the dead unless there is an overwhelming, massive amount of evidence to show that they do. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've just jolted once again by the lack of evidence uh, here. And let me just go through that. Now, David wants us to believe. I want you, I want you to imagine David wants us to believe in yinianity based on a guy named Ying, who he claims was resurrected in 4th century China. Now, you heard the statistics that 90% of the people in China think they were healed. When they are healed, they're healed, you know, supernaturally. So that would stand a reason that China would be a superstitious country. If you approach the evidence like that, I chose Ying Yanity on purpose because it sounds like Christianity, uh, and based on 4th century documents that uh, uh, resemble Christianity in every way. Uh, Ying was raised from the dead. He was believed to have saved the world you know, from their sins, and he died, on, died in some horrific death. And he was prophesied based on some ancient uh, text before that. And uh, we recently found these documents. We recently found these texts in an archaeological dig, dig somewhere. The religion, of course, has died out. And the reason why it died out is because some guy named Mao in Beijing uh, conquered the land and rid itself of Yingyanity. So it, it, basically uh, went out of existence, and he established a different religion in its place. Not Yingyanity, but some other kind of religion. Now, this died out. And David's here. He's trying to convince us in, to believe in Ying, and Yingyanity based solely on 4th century documents. That is, documents that are um, four centuries old. That's twice the length of... Um, time America has been in existence. Now let's just say we wanted to evaluate whether George Washington existed. And all we have are published results of, um, you know, George Washington, uh, you know, when was this published? Well, 2015. What does it say he did? Well, he cut down cherry tree. What else does it say that he was the president of the United States? Well, what else? Well, he was married to Martha. What else? 
Well, where's the earlier sources? Well, we have little fragments here and there. Here's a little fragment here, you know. But what did the surrounding fragments say? What did the surrounding documents say? Well, we're assuming it's the same as uh, what we have, but we don't know. We can't say that. And um, you wouldn't have any reason to believe that George Washington didn't exist unless you could trace it back to earlier sources, especially if there were reasons for, to, for thinking that those texts were doctored up. Okay, next. All right, now why am I asking you to do this? Why am I asking you to look at it differently? Because it's the only way to do things. It's the only way to actually evaluate the truth of your religion. Why? Because you were raised to believe this religion, weren't you? <laughs> I mean, you were raised to believe as Christians. You know nothing else, most of you. You need to actually ask yourself what it would look like to uh, be in, uh, in, uh, confronted with a, a trinity as a Muslim. Or a virgin birth as a, as a, as a, as a Hindu. You need to ask yourself what it would be like to, for the very first time, hear of an incarnate God, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a Jew. Uh, you need to ask yourself all these sorts of questions because they sound bizarre. I mean, they sound bizarre when you first hear them, but because you're familiar with them, that's the only difference. That's the only difference. You're familiar with them, and so therefore they, they have the ring of truth to them without the evidence. Now let me get to the evidence because that's an important thing. Okay, next slide. Uh, it's the best way to do that. Okay, next. Because we depend on familiarity. I mentioned that. We depend on our cultures. Next thing. And we seek to confirm rather than disconfirm our, our beliefs. Next, please. Now, here's the kicker. Would you, one more time. It would take an overwhelming amount of strong historical evidence to overcome our concrete personal experience that dead men stay dead. Now, you don't, you've never seen anybody raised from the dead. And yet you believe somebody raised from the dead based on a, a, a fourth century manuscript? Yeah, I, I just find that stunning, actually. I mean, I, I can't believe that. Next, please. Now, here's my argument. Now, you think, you think I'm a, a radical. You think I'm, I'm angry. I'm not. I'm just nervous. <laughs> trust me, I'm just nervous. <laughs> and I was just, uh, really, trust me, I, I just am nervous. And, and I'm, I was stunned once again. I mean, I, I really was stunned, even though... I've participated in these debates for, you know, more than a decade. To hear it all over again, all, it's just, okay. I'm not mad. <laughs> I'm a really good guy, you know. I, I was just stunned, okay? Not, okay. I'm sure he's stunned at my views, too. So I'll, I'll, I'll say that for him, right? I'll say that for him as well. My argument is this. Go ahead, click through these. Even if God exists, next. Even if miracles are possible, next. Even if yin yang is true, next. Even if yin was resurrected, stop. Even if there were eyewitnesses, there is no reason for us to believe that Ying was raised from the dead in China in 33 AD based on 4th century manuscripts. All of the evidence for Ying's resurrection are based on those writings that we have only as 4th century documents. You say, well, people believed it before the 4th century. Well, sure they did. Some of it, we don't know exactly what they believed. That's the point. We don't know exactly what they believed. We don't know how, how, many, of those, how many times those documents were uh, uh, messed with. We know that Josephus and, and uh, Dr. Wood were confirming this. Josephus was tampered with. We know that. We also know that the church tampered another document called the Donation of Constantine. That's where they said, uh, yeah, it's a great way to, you can lie when nobody can catch you. But they documented that uh, and the Emperor Constantine gave the Vatican the land that it now sits on. <laughs> And they, they forged a document. We know this now because of, of writing samples and, how, how they, and, and, and samples of the uh, parchment itself. So um, we, know, we know the church doctored things. We know this. Um, and uh, there's just no reason, even if it's true, there's a lot of things that are true that we have no reason to believe. Like, um, there might be a criminal in this audience. There might be somebody wanted by the law. I just threw that out here. Might be a serious crime. I'm not going to like say it was you. <laughs> don't 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 worry about that. <laughs> but there might be a criminal in here of a serious crime, and no one suspects you did it because the evidence isn't there. It's like that. It might have happened, but there's not enough evidence to think it. You know, it did. Uh, there might be uh, somebody might be abducted by aliens. <laughs> I, I believe that just about as much as I believe this to be. So we sure, and someone might actually have been abducted by aliens, but there's not enough evidence for us to believe even if he was. That's my point. All right, that's ten minutes. Let's go. Where's, now here's here's the point. Where's the empirical evidence? Please next. 
There is none. Next. Because the resurrection of Ying, or Jesus, supposedly happened in the ancient pre-scientific past in a lone part of the planet before investigative reporters, videos, and cell phones. I never shook his hand. I never held his, held his body close to mine. I never got kissed on the lips by him. I never took off his sandals. I wasn't there to hear his words. No cell phone did either. There's no empirical evidence Jesus or Yang raised from the dead. Next, please. Where's the textual evidence? Fourth century text. Just let that sink in. Next, please. Uh, they contain forgeries. Uh, the ending of the Gospel of Mark is one of them, and, and, and Mark's Gospel does not mention a resurrection. That's why when David was quoting Matthew earlier, the very first text he put up there, he had to quote from Matthew on the resurrection because Mark never mentioned it. And neither is it mentioned in Q, the, the, the document some scholars think uh, predated the Gospel of Mark. The resurrection of Jesus was not mentioned in either Q or Mark. It waited till Matthew to be mentioned. Next, please. No reliable external evidence to date these texts. You know, scholars are debating whether uh, the Gospels were, were uh, written in the 50, 50 AD or, or as much as late as 140 AD. Luke Gospel has been dated to, uh, to um, 140 AD. We, they, they can't date them because they, there's not enough evidence to know when they were dated. Well, that's like Yang's text in the, in the uh, fourth century in China, too. You can't date them, not very well. So how do you know how long they've been you know, around to be doctored up? Please, next. And it excludes other early Gospels. Uh, there's a, all kinds of Gospels. Gospels of Peter, Gospel of Judas. I think there's a Gospel of Mary. Now, who chose to put these things in the Bible? Well, the church did. And why not the Gnostic church? Why, did, why didn't the Gnostic church get to decide our Bible? There was a Gnostic church. They didn't believe Jesus was a fleshly being. It's because the Catholic church won the day. And when you win the day, you get to select the text that supports your views. It's true. And you can even doctor those texts. As Bart Ehrman, uh, he quoted earlier, uh, shows us, uh, they, they actually they, they changed vowels, they changed letters, they changed words, they changed sentences, they changed text, they inserted text. Some of the documents in your Bible, like 1st and 2nd, 2nd Timothy, Titus, 2nd Peter, and 2nd Thessalonians, are forgeries. They're in there, though, because they didn't know how to determine truth from falsehood. Next, please. Where's the prophetic evidence? There is none. Now, here, here's going to surprise you. Here's going to surprise you. And this might be the debate. Now, there are some uh, uh, Jews, uh, believers in Judaism here in the audience today. And um, um, they would verify this for me. Um, there, there is no prophet, prophetic evidence that singularly points to Jesus as the Messiah um, from the Old Testament. None. Please. There's no prophecy of a Trinitarian God. Next. No prophecy of an incarnation. None. Next. No prophecy of a virgin birth. Next. And no prophecy of a divine, dying Messiah. You're going to quote Isaiah 53 to me, but that was clearly about Israel itself. Look at Isaiah chapter 49, verse 3. Next. And no prophecy of a resurrection. This he'll agree with me about. That, that one, that last one, he'll agree with me. There's no prophecy of a resurrection. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's... It, it seems to me that what, I'm going to get to what happened in a minute. Next, please. Where's the first hand testimonial evidence? There is none. What you have is fourth century documents. Next, please. Uh, no eyewitnesses wrote anything. He'll, he'll verify that. He'll say, yeah, that's true. No, no eyewitness. Jesus didn't. Paul, but Paul didn't actually uh, see. His, it, it, he, he says he saw something. Okay, we'd, we'd have to dispute that. But um, the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, they were not eyewitnesses. We know this. Those are the names attached to Gospels written later. Some scholars think that Matthew was written by a school called the, Math the Matthew School. And uh, that was probably around uh, 70, 80 AD. That's really a long time away from eyewitnesses. Next, please. Uh, we don't have a chance to question them. We, we can't question Herod. We can't question Ananias, Caiaphas. We don't have a chance to... to, uh, to Look, what you want to do when you examine Mormonism is you want to be able to investigate the people who said, we, we saw this or we didn't see this. They say, well, we saw the golden plates, we didn't. But, we, but if we ask them, what did you actually see? Let's put you in a microphone, microscope and let's uh, put you on a stand and ask you all kinds of investigative journalist questions. We're going to try, find some inconsistencies and problems. We can't do that with the New Testament. We can't do that with the apostles. And he might point to 1 Corinthians 15 all he wants, but it says nothing about what they saw, if they saw anything. I mean, Paul says they did. 
But it says nothing about what they saw. What if they had discrepancies uh, among their stories? We, we saw this, we saw this, we saw a ghost. One in the Gospel of Luke, it says that Jesus was seen like a ghost. Um, what did they see? I mean, you're saying, you're saying they all have the same testimony, but do they? Next, please. It contains discrepancies, when did they arrive at the tomb, what time of the day, who rolled the stone away. Uh, actually, Luke disputes Matthew. Matthew says that the guard at the tomb was placed uh, there to, to guard the, the, so that nobody would uh, you know, be able to um, steal the body. And, um, and then Luke comes along, he says, you know, I've investigated everything and I want to write down most orderly what actually happened. He says that in the first chapter, verse, the first three verses. He says, I'm going to write down what exactly happened. And he left out the story of the guard of the tomb. That means, folks, Luke didn't agree with Matthew's story of the guard of the tomb. It doesn't make sense anyway. Next, please. Shows evolutionary growth. Uh, the, the stone becomes a big stone, then becomes a new stone, then becomes a heavy stone. The um, uh, other things like that. Next. Oh, uh, right, don't forget the last one, uh, uh, visionaries. The, like, like the Mormons, like the growth of the Mormon church, it started with the people who saw visions. There's a different kind of people that uh, we don't understand. They're, they're um, superstitious people. They, they have dreams, and they, they, they see things, or they think they see things, and, they, and these, are, these are people. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that he learned about the Lord's Supper from a vision. He also says in Galatians 1 that he did not receive 1 Corinthians 15. He says, I, I did not receive any tradition from those early apostles. So that, that's a, his either contradiction or we've got to go through that. Uh, and, the, and the first two chapters of Revelation, the book of Revelation, uh, the revelator, John, says he heard a vision from on high, Jesus. Jesus was talking to him. And he dictates seven letters to the seven churches. Now, who among us would actually believe someone who said, you know, I, I heard a vision, uh, I saw a vision, and Jesus was talking to me, and I wrote down seven letters to seven churches in this area, and sent them by horseback if you want, and here, you can uh, have your letter from, Je from Jesus, you know, because of my vision, and here you can, and you're the lukewarm church, <laughs> you know, not you, but you over there, you're the lukewarm church, and, and I had this vision, you see, and Jesus said, he's going to spit you out of your mouth. Here, and would you really, would you really accept that? Well, these are visionaries, folks, and these are visionaries. Visionaries have the ability to see things that didn't happen, and you're calling them good witnesses? Next, please. Where's the corroborative evidence? None. None. Where's the corroborative evidence that there was an earthquake or that there was an eclipse or that the saints came out of the tombs and uh, roam the streets of Jerusalem after, as Jesus was resurrected from the dead. No account of it at all. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Philo must have missed that. You see, Philo lived and worked and, and uh, rode through the lands of Palestine, and he didn't record any of that. Really, the saints, you know, David, you know, Solomon, uh, the prophet Elijah, uh, Isaiah, roaming the streets, and Philo never makes, makes a mention of it. Now, um, David's friend Michael Lycona doesn't believe that happened. And I, I support that. I agree with him on that. But it makes the whole story incredible. Just think of you, you're interviewing somebody to know whether to put them on a stand in a trial. And the person breaks out and says, I see Jesus up there. Or, or I see blood on the wall. Or I see something incredibly crazy. Or I feel like ants are crawling all up my body. It discredits the entire testimony to find that in the Gospel of Matthew. Next, please. I mentioned those. But, um, uh, yeah, next. Next, 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 done. Jews. Final argument. There were 8 million Jews in the time of Jesus. And according to this Catholic biblical scholar, uh, David Sim, uh, who looked at the evidence and the, and the censuses that were taken of those days and eras and uh, what were written about the numbers of Jews that were at the time, uh, 8 million of them, uh, 7 million living in a known world, 2. 5 million living in Palestine. They were beloved of God. They believed in God. You can't, you can't call them atheists, you see. <laughs> Woo, got that off our backs. They believed in miracles. They believed in all the miracles of the Old Testament. They hoped for a Messiah. They knew their Old Testament prophecies, but they didn't believe. A lot of them.
Now, you can claim they got their Old Testament prophecies wrong all you want, but then who, who wrote them? Who, who supposedly inspired them? Who, who predicted the events, whatever they were? That would mean that God purposely misled them. Other, their choices are uh, the, the Jews, 8 million of them, 2.5 living in the area, were incredibly stupid people. Not to know the prophecies. A, incredibly evil people. Not wanting to uh, believe their prophecies. Or that God misled them about the prophecies. I already said there was no prophecy about a resurrection, right? There isn't. Well, that would mean he condemned them to hell, too. And to, and to all of, the, uh, all of the, uh, the problems that they've suffered at the hands of Christians who view them as Christ killers. Uh, so, uh, if, one more, please. Would you believe in Yingianity with this non-evidence if it was defended by Ying apologists where 80% of them rejected the sufficiency of historical evidence? There's a first part of this presentation I didn't, I didn't go into. And I talk about apologetical methods and I'm done. But 80% um, of Christian apologists reject the evidential method of apologetics in, in favor of classical apologetics, apologetics or presuppositionalism uh, or um, uh, faithism or something like that. So 80% of Christians reject the sufficiency of historical evidence, and these are the reasons why. Sorry if I was a little nervous, but that's, uh, I was just, okay, thank you, bye. That concludes our two 20-minute opening statements. Now we will have eight-minute rebuttals from each side. 12-minute rebuttals. We will have 12-minute rebuttals from each side. Let me reset my counter, and he is exactly right. Terrific moderator tonight. John, John, John. <laughs> David, David, David. What are you apologizing for? Oh, I, got, uh, I got a little... Now, if you want to apologize enemy. for saying you're shocked, uh, you could do that because I'm the one who is shocked. I was really expecting John to, to go through the evidence. Instead, John decided to adopt a, a, an extremely skeptical position, and we'll go through that a bit. But John asks us to uh, imagine that we had never uh, been raised to believe in Christianity. It wasn't. My dad told me he was God. Um, uh, and ju just, just, just to be clear here, there, here's my friend uh, Guillaume Bignon, he's, uh, uh, he's a former atheist, my wife was an agnostic when she examined the evidence, my friend Nabil was a Muslim when he examined the evidence for the resurrection. We all came to believe in the resurrection. Uh, so if it's simply a matter of pretend you weren't raised to believe this, several of us don't need to pretend this, um, and we came to believe. Apart from that, um, notice, I, I sort of took this as far as I could take it. John's little test, you know, imagine you're not a Christian. Imagine you, you're not raised to be a Christian. Imagine you're, uh, you're, you're outside of Christianity or something. Uh, notice all of the, the facts that I base my case on. I quoted non-Christian scholars, uh, scholars who specialize in this field, scholars who, despite not being Christian, have dedicated their lives to examining this material, and they agree. And why is that important? Because John, it seems, just thinks we can't know anything. Right? We're, basing this on, we're basing our beliefs on 4th century documents. Well, why do these people who examine the ancient manuscripts conclude that we can know facts about Jesus with absolute certainty, that we can be certain that he was historically certain, not, not mathematically certain, but historically certain, that uh, Jesus died by crucifixion, or that we can be historically certain that his disciples were convinced that he appeared to them. Why do they say these things? Are they stupid? Are they, have, they, have they not learned? Have they not heard John's uh, message about Yingianity? Uh, no, because they look at the manuscripts and they understand how textual criticism works, right? They understand, hey, we've got manuscripts over here from Europe. We've got manuscripts across northern Africa. We've got manuscripts over here. We've got fragments going back to the second and third centuries. And we have records from the early church fathers who are quoting these passages. And these, pa these manuscripts went spread so far and so fast that when you change them, you can spot. John says, ah, but there are, there are additions and they're right. How do they know? How do scholars know that something is an addition? Because if you're a scribe writing in the 6th century and you write something and you're in the Middle East, that difference doesn't show up in Europe. That difference doesn't show up in Egypt. So you can spot them. Uh, I believe it was Daniel Wallace who told me that uh, if you piled up our manuscripts that we have, it would stretch to over a mile high. 
And we look at this, and it seems that, let me put it this way, if you're going to say, we can't know because we're looking at, you know, we're looking at manuscripts um, and not the originals, according to John, we can't know what Plato taught, we can't know what Aristotle taught, we can't know what Homer said, we can't know any of these things. And ju just to be clear, that is so radically skeptical. We know almost nothing about ancient history. We, know, we, would, we wouldn't know anything unless you, unless you, you know, find an archaeological monument or something like this that was built right when it happened or something like that. Um, and so this is a kind of radical skepticism. Why would John adopt this approach when it's rejected by almost everyone, Christian or non-Christian? Why would he adopt this approach? Because you have to, right? You have to if you want to avoid uh, the resurrection. You can either state your biases or you can adopt an extremely skeptical position because if you just go with the facts, again, even the facts that are agreed upon by very critical scholars, uh, the, it kind of looks like Jesus rose from the dead. And, I, and when I say kind of, I mean it's the only thing that actually fits the facts. So, uh, what we agree on, I'm not sure exactly what we agree on I, because I haven't heard John sort of explain the evidence. Keep in mind, we have evidence, right? If, if, John, if John is saying that every expert, every respected scholar uh, who examines these issues is wrong, that we know about Jesus' death, if he's saying that every scholar is wrong, that we know what the Apostle Paul believed, that Paul converted, that the Apostles believed, uh, that they were convinced that he had appeared to them risen from the dead. Uh, if John is saying we don't know any of this, um, then uh, keep in mind I'm going to allow him to uh, modify his position, but you know, if, if we go through the debate and it's just skepticism, skepticism, skepticism all the way down without ever actually accounting for any of the facts that we actually have, uh, not sure how far we'll get tonight. Um, documents. Again, John says we uh, base our Christian belief on uh, fourth century documents. We have, certainly have a, a manuscript earlier than that. Um, but again, if, if the, the, the Bible starts getting translated in the second century and the third century and so on, you have full-blown copies by the time you get to the fourth century. But no one, no one in the field of textual criticism is so skeptical that they say you can't figure out, you can't figure out uh, what, the earlier, what earlier manuscripts said. Um, even if you go with all the differences, there, 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 keep in mind there are lots of differences. If you're copying something by hand, there are going to be differences. Um, but if you talk about the differences that actually matter, the, di the differences that can go back to the original, um, or, or, and the differences that are actually meaningful, it's not just a spelling difference like spelling John with one N or two Ns, um, there's almost nothing, and even Bart Ehrman would agree, there's nothing that would, uh, that would affect any major Christian doctrine that would cause you to believe that a major Christian doctrine like the resurrection or the deity of Christ is false. You never get, you go back in time, looking at all the manuscripts, you never find a Jesus who didn't die on the cross or who didn't rise from the dead. Uh, you just don't find that sort of thing. So if you're saying, that we just don't know, it's, you're saying textual criticism doesn't work, you can have all the manuscripts, you can have uh, 5,800 plus Greek manuscripts, um, and you can just never figure out anything uh, with any degree of certainty. Uh, wow, it, it, so this would come down to, if you're that skeptical, if you're that skeptical, then yes, you might as well reject Christianity. Um, but if you're that skeptical, you might as well you know, believe you're not even here right now and you're seeing some sort of hallucination or something. discrepancies in the Gospels. John says Luke didn't agree with the story of the empty tomb because he left it out. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but if you notice, Matthew, Luke, John, and Acts are all about the same length. And why is that? Was, that? was that just random that they're all about the same length? Uh, no, that's, that's uh, back in the day, before we had books. Right now you can make books as big as you want. Uh, but back then, you wrote on scrolls, right? And the maximum length of a scroll that you could get is about the length of Matthew, Luke, and John. For some reason, Mark wanted his a little bit shorter. Um, and Acts. But there's a reason. Uh, you, you have a limited amount of text. So if you wanted to include certain stories and certain miracles, you had to leave other things out. And so it's just, it's just a, a, very, a very interesting method to say, if one writer includes something that another writer doesn't include, it's because the other writer rejects it and believes that that story is false. And that's just silly. Everyone's dealing with material that they have to sift through and say, what am I going to include? What am I not going to include? So to say, Luke didn't believe there's a guard at the tomb because he doesn't list it. Well, Luke has a full gospel as is. If he includes it, then you'd have to start uh, uh, part two, and carrying around two scrolls is going to get uh, going to upset a lot of people. 
He said that the, the Gospels show evolutionary growth. This is another common uh, approach among, uh, among atheists, and that to say, look, here's a story, and here's a story that tells more, and here's a story that tells even more. Therefore, there's, a, there's, there's an evolutionary process. They're inventing it as they go along. Um, I actually showed in a, an article in responding to uh, Dan Barker where he advocates this about the resurrection stories. You can put the Gospels in any order you want and then pick out the stories where one, it, where, where one has more detail and say, you see, there's a, there, it's an evolution, it's a growth, right? Now, if you can put them in any order and say, you see, they're inventing the story as they go along, uh, that means you're just picking and choosing which stories different writers uh, sort of uh, added more detail to. And if you want to go that route, notice the most appearances that we have of any source happen to be our earliest source, the First Corinthians Creed that I quoted. This goes back to within just a couple years of the crucifixion. This is not according to me. This is according to uh, just about every respected scholar writing on this topic. We quoted a bunch of them. They all agree. Why does John think we, don't, we have no clue? We have no idea when any of this is from. Because he's, more, he's, more, he's being more skeptical than every respected scholar on the planet. And uh, again, if you're gonna be that skeptical, um, uh, carry it through, carry it through to its logical conclusion. Um, one second. John, oh, no, not that. John says not, that, not, not that. John says ah. that. John says that Mark doesn't, doesn't include a resurrection and that's why I had to include uh, that's why I had to quote from Matthew, because there's no resurrection in the Gospel of Mark. Um, it's thought by, by many, it's not agreed upon, that the original Gospel of Mark ended at verse 8. Uh, but let's look. Entering the, tomb, they saw, entering the tomb, chapter 16, verse 5. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You were looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. That's verse 6. That's in the, that's in the gospel of, uh, of Mark. So certainly includes a resurrection there. Um, John says, uh, John complains that we exclude the other, the other early gospels. Well, this is just, this is, this is hilarious. He mentions the gospel of Judas and the gospel of Mary. These start around the middle of the second century. Right? The God, have you, by the way, have you... Raise your hand if you've read the Gospel of Judas. I read that thing. Sounds like it's written by aliens, doesn't it? Right? Sounds like it's written by aliens, just the terminology, and that's because it's based on Neoplatonic Greek philosophy, right? They're talking about the pleroma of this, and it's, it's clear that first century uh, people were not talking like this. And if you go through, why, why don't we, think what John is saying. Why don't you include the second, third, fourth, fifth century uh, books that are clearly, ha that are clearly not uh, do not go back to the original disciples of Jesus. Why do you do that? Why do you prefer Gospels that are first century documents uh, and that go back either written by the apostles, I believe that John uh, was there for the Gospel of John, that Matthew wrote Matthew and so on, um, or to people working very closely to them? Why do you want to do that? I mean, think about these questions. Why do you go with the first century instead of the second, third, fourth, fifth century? I don't know, because one is actually connected to Jesus and the others aren't? I don't know. Um, he, refer, he says that the resurrection is not mentioned in Q. Well, the, the Q, it, there's no Q anywhere. Uh, there's no official Q document, but Q, Q is a sayings document. It's the sayings of Jesus, right? It's not the history of Jesus, right? So if it's a collection of Jesus' sayings, it obviously isn't going to include the narration of his resurrection because it's a collection of his sayings, if it's anything. Um, John says Isaiah 53 refers to the nation of Israel. Um, uh, well, the, the suffering servant dies for the sins of Israel, as, as a sacrifice for the sins of Israel, and so it would be weird if it is the nation of Israel. It says no prophecy about the resurrection. I would invite John to read Acts 2 and Acts 13, where the apostles use one. Now, John uses, John adopts the method of a modern atheist reading these texts. I'd invite him to use the method of a uh, first century Jew in reading the text. Get a different outcome. Thank you, David. And now for the uh, for John's 12-minute first rebuttal. I'll be nicer this time. I promise. I'm, I'm, I'm just usually that way. Um, I would run down a few things. Um, he uh, had mentioned um, Q, you know, sayings. I'm going to start back there. Um, well, well, then where the uh, 
I mean, that was the earliest, supposedly. It's not an actual documents, but they've surmised might have existed from looking at the comparisons of the Synoptist Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, so why aren't there any events d you know, described? He says, it's a sayings gospel. It was first. If it, you know, that's what they assume it exists. But there's no events. Who included the events? And there's no resurrection in there. Uh, and Mark uh, does end by someone in, uh, in white clothes. Uh, that I don't think we know whether it's angels or just people in white clothes saying, he's not here, he's risen. Oh, uh, that'll satisfy me. Yeah, yeah, that, that does it. That's perfect. Have somebody sit there and says, he's risen. Yeah, yeah, that, is that all the evidence people need? Um, so no, there's no resurrection appearance in, in Mark. There's no touching, see the, seeing, feeling thing. That was added uh, later in uh, Matthew's gospel. Uh, as far as the gospels of Judas and Peter, the second century, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are scholars who date Luke at uh, 140, the second century, uh, and um, the gospel of John, second century. Um, but obviously those gospels are original from somebody important, certainly not the, the apostles. We know that. We know those gospels were not written by the apostles. We know that. But apparently Judas and um, uh, Peter don't count just because they're not in the, I mean, you know, they're not in the present Bible. You know, and apparently we know um, how they concluded those sorts of questions, uh, you know, and uh, which I don't. <clears throat> Now, he mentioned, mentioned something about Luke and the scrolls, you know, how long the, the scrolls were, and Luke obviously didn't have the room to put the, garden, uh, the, the guard's story in his gospel because he had other more important things to, uh, to write about. I want to be the first atheist debater ever in the world to say this. I don't know about that. Maybe you're right. I'm not doing this sarcastically. I'll have to look into that. Although I doubt it. <laughs> scrolls can come in different lengths. But, I mean, what do you mean? They all had the same length of scroll? That initially sounds odd to me. That's all. I don't have the facts to, to dispute that. Okay? But I will say this. The, 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 the story of the guard at the tomb, as told in Matthew's gospel, is ludicrous. That's why Luke probably wanted to uh, not include it. Here's why. It says that uh, the guard at the tomb was placed on the, um, uh, at, the, at the tomb where Jesus was supposed to be, was uh, buried. And I accept that he died. I'm not questioning everything. I'm not questioning everything. Um, I'm questioning the resurrection, okay? Not everything. Um, that the guard was posted on Saturday, uh, or, uh, the, day, the day after, the day after Jesus died. It gave the disciples plenty of time to steal the body if they wanted to. It's, it's, it's a flawed cover-up story. And that when the, the angels came by, the guards fell to the, uh, the ground, uh, you know, blinded and, and, and like dead. Oh, yeah, I'm going to tell you what happened after that. Yeah, 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 Jesus rose from the dead. Yeah, I saw it clearly through my death stupor coma. The, the, the story itself is implausible, the, the guard at the tomb. I mean, and then they're going to go to their, their leaders, which would have been Pilate, not the Jews. And they would have told Pilate, hey, Pilate, guess what? <laughs> the disciples stole the body. <laughs> Dang them. I can't believe that. I don't see that happening myself. You know, I just don't see it happening. If they actually saw Jesus rise from the dead, you know what I would do? I'm leaving town. <laughs> I'm hijacking out of here, you know? But no, I'm going to go tell Pilate because he just might kill me. So, so the, the story itself lacks plausibility all in and of itself. So, it stands the reason Luke wouldn't want to include it. Now, just some things. Um, by the way, I like David. I consider him my friend. Uh, I, I'm just uh, sorry that he wanted to get it beaten again, <laughs> as he did the first two times, which is just rhetoric, of course. Uh, supposed to, to, to lighten the mood, but it doesn't always work. Um, <laughs> now, you mentioned something about historically certain. This is historically certain. Bart Ehrman says that. I can't believe he says that. I just can't believe he says that. There is nothing historically certain. Nothing. I mean, some things have more or less probability to them, and we should think exclusively in terms of probabilities. And if we think exclusively in terms of probabilities, then there's no room for faith. Flip a coin. It's going to flip, come up 50% heads, 50% tails. Oh, I'm sorry, I have faith. It doesn't change the odds. Um, now, I had no prior commitment to naturalism either, David. I believed, I studied, I preached, 
14 years. I taught in Bible colleges. I was a budding apologist. I had no prior commitment to naturalism, you know, and you know this. Um, uh, I would think that God, if he exists, would uh, pay particular uh, good attention to me, too, <laughs> uh, back in those days, especially if he had foreknowledge. He would have said, you know what, that John Loftus, you know, I, I better make sure he doesn't leave the fold. I mean, I better, I better make Dan, good sure. <laughs> sorry, I really am sorry. I really am sorry. I better make good and sure he doesn't lose, lose his faith. Uh, like the parable of the lost sheep. I mean, if there's a lost sheep I better go after, I better go after him because he's writing all these books and he's debating all these people. I better make sure it doesn't happen. I don't care what it takes. You know, I might even snap my fingers and take away his critical thinking capacities so that he will believe even though the evidence is against what he believes. Because I'm sovereign that way. I can do that just like I did to Saul on the Damascus Road. Saul, he was, of course, a persecutor of the church, and you know, somehow he was able to change Saul's mind without abrogating his free will. And if he could do that once, he could do it more than once. Why not me? Um, that's if he cared. That's if he existed, if he cared. Um, now, it's, now it, unsettling conclusions, you said that, unsettling implications. I want to believe, David. You know why? I was, I'll be honest, uh, there was a, there was a uh, not too long ago, I was uh, facing some difficulties. And I said, I'd like to cry out to God. True, true story. I'd like to, I can't. He doesn't exist. Oh, dang. Serious. I mean, I want to believe that there's a guy up in the sky that can take care of me when I'm in need. I really do. Um, and as far as those, uh, those ethical obligations that you say I'm, I don't want to obey, well, uh, I suppose you don't want to be a Janus then either. I suppose you're rejecting Janism because they don't eat live fruit. They, they wait till the fruit drops on the ground before they eat it, right? Oh, those, those ethical obligations are too great for me. I can't b abide by them, so I'm going to reject Jainism. No, that's not, that's not the ethical obligations we're talking about. We're talking about kind of, uh, more serious ones that we just uh, uh, are really opposed to. Oh, as far as Jesus mythers go and the scholarship, it's changed. Richard Carrier has written a book called The, the Historical Jesus, the, the Quest for the Historical Jesus. It's published by Sheffield Press in 2014. I am not a Jesus mythicer myself. I mean, I do believe that there was an apocalyptic Jesus who existed some, you know, somewhat, at least for now I think that. Uh, but that book is now put uh, the Jesus mythicist position on the boards because Sheffield Press is the major, the major Christian scholarly press when it comes to biblical studies. That's a big book. So they're taking that uh, position seriously now. Just keep in mind that he's, uh, he, all, he has, all he does is quote from fourth century texts. I want you to consider the Mormon church. Scientology, if you will. Don't you want to get to the source of, let's say the Mormon church. Don't you want to know about it? And let's say all you knew were their writings. That's all you knew, the Mormon church's writings. Now they hide some of them, of course. <laughs> they don't want you to see some of them, but that's all you knew. There weren't in investigative reporters back then. And you would want to, I would want to ask Peter, the, the apostle, I would, I would want to ask him, what did you see? When did you see it? Why did you see it? Um, you know, uh, were you re really with him? What, what did you hear him say? What did you hear him teach? Uh, how did, how did, you, did you actually see him rise from the dead? I mean, uh, I, and then I would ask each of the other disciples. And maybe one of them recanted their testimony. Maybe they were named and that never testified before anyway. We just don't know that Paul says so. He says so to the Corinthian church, which is... Half uh, around the Mediterranean Sea, half around the Mediterranean Sea, uh, not easily attained, not easily gotten to. He, write, he writes a letter, and these people say, you know, saw this. There's no way to check that. But he includes the testimony of 500 anonymous, anonymous people in that listing of people who saw Jesus. 500. That's an odd number. But why not 501? Why not 499? No, 500. 500 because that's how many there were. I counted them. Um, doesn't that undercut the credibility of the story itself when you throw in a number like that? Ah, just throw in 500. It sounds like a good number of people. And we do know that in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul was talking about visions. They're visionary people. 
And he says, I saw Jesus in a vision. In uh, Acts chapter 26, verse 19, he says that before King Agrippa, I think. He says it was a vision. He says my Damascus Road trip was a vision. Of course, how could he have seen Jesus when it says he was blinded? And, uh, anyway, how do you, you know it was Jesus? You know, by his own testimony. So he says these other people saw Jesus in the same way in 1 Corinthians 15. So there just really isn't any evidence. I mean, no cooperative evidence, no eyewitness testimony. All we have is 4th century documents uh, from, uh, just think of Ying and Ying Yanni, and you really shouldn't believe. Sorry if I've used up more of my time or beat up on him too much. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Uh, now David with his eight-minute second rebuttal. Thank you, John. But know that this is uh, going to hurt you more than it hurts me. <laughs> John says that nothing is historically certain. Well, it's pretty, I already said we're not talking about mathematical certainty here, but there is, a, there is historical certainty where there is just no reasonable reason to believe anything other than what, uh, what, what, is, what is the case. Um, and again, the, the, the facts that I laid down um, what refutation have we seen of any of these facts, right? We're, we're, we're coming, we're about to be, you know, going to the crossfire and conclusions. What, what evidence have we seen that Jesus didn't die on the cross, that his disciples weren't convinced that he appeared to them, that Paul and James, who didn't believe in Jesus at first, but came to believe in him after uh, they claimed that they received appearances, um, or the original apostles? Uh, what, what evidence have we had that, that none of this happened? Uh, and the answer is none. We've just got, well, you can't base your beliefs on fourth century text. When again, every respected scholar on the planet understands how textual criticism works that you can get. There's, there's, there, there, are, there are no variants that would affect any of these beliefs. So you take any manuscript you want. There's nothing that would affect anything I've said so far. And even if you wanted to throw all of that out, we know what the next generation of Christian leaders uh, proclaim, people who knew the apostles. We are not in a state of just, we don't know anything that could ever happen or anything that happened. Uh, it's, just a, it's just a position where if you want to go that far, we just can't know anything. John says, uh, again, the Gospels don't contain eyewitness testimony. I would invite uh, him to read Richard Bauckham's Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, where he, uh, he goes through the Gospels and shows uh, that they are filled with eyewitness testimony, even if you don't want to want to grant um, uh, an authorship by the apostle. Um, he says that the story of the guard at the tomb is ludicrous. By the way, did I base anything on the story of the guard at the tomb? Did I base one point on the story of the guard at the tomb? If you... Get rid of the Gospel of Matthew. Nothing I say is affected, right? If you get rid of the Gospel of Luke, nothing I say has been affected. I went to, a, to material that is much earlier than the Gospels, right? And the, I went there because it's actual scholars, atheist, agnostic scholars saying, yes, Christians, if you want to go with some material, go with this. It's the earliest. It's indisputable. Um, but with the story, even with the story, John, it's obviously it's obviously absurd. But look at what Matthew says about the story. He says, and this is the, when, when he explains that that the, the guards were 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 paid. He said that this is the, this is the story that is circulated among Jews till this day. It was a common story, right? People had heard the story. He's responding to an objection by the Jews. Well, if the Jews are the ones telling the story, why does he? Why does John think that Matthew is making it up and that everyone else rejects it? Uh, Paul says that uh, Paul, I mean, uh, John says that Paul refers to 500 rather than 499 or 501. This calls into, calls into question the credibility. Paul says more than 500, right? Uh, in other words, he doesn't have an exact number. It's more than 500 though, right? It's like the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000. How would we know? Well, Jesus actually had them sit in groups of 50 and 100. So you'd have, okay, 50, 50, 50. You could count, right, without getting an exact number. Uh, I don't see how that would call into question. If it said 503, I would say that might call into question the uh, reliability. Saying it was more than 500, uh, I don't see a problem here. Um, John... John says that if God exists, he, he sure would have wanted, uh, wanted to keep John in the fold by giving him, you know, some sort of miracles or something like that. Uh, because of all the damage John is going to do and God would really, but suppose God allowed this to happen to give me this opportunity to show how flimsy people's reasons are for leaving Christianity. John says he wants to believe by becoming as skeptical as possible by becoming more skeptical than any respected scholar on the planet, by becoming so unimaginably skeptical that we have to reject all of history. That's, uh, that's someone who wants to believe. Now, John says, John argues that, uh, that Paul's experience was visionary, and he even says 
that uh, Paul in Galatians 1 denies that he received any uh, historical tradition from the apostles. That's absolute nonsense. If you look at Galatians 1, when Paul says that his gospel is not from man and he didn't receive it from man, read what he says in chapter 2. He's saying he got the gospel to the Gentiles, whereas the other apostles got the gospels to the Jews, right? So he gets some sort of revelation along the line of a gospel that he gets to preach to Gentiles, telling them they don't need, circum they don't need to be circumcised, they don't need to follow kosher diet, laws and so on and that he's got in th this is the message this is what he's talking about in the gospel they are not whether Jesus died on the cross or rose from the dead that's not in dispute so what do we have we have uh, he says that Paul is visionary well notice even in the even in the instances that we have that talk about Paul's experience uh, for, as John already mentioned Paul says that he saw Jesus and the accounts that we have in the gospel of Acts there were certainly objective uh, objective features of this appearance so if you want to say vision that's fine, but acknowledge this isn't just a mentally subjective appearance, right? It's something out there because other people are seeing light, hearing noise um, as well. But here's, I mean, here's the kicker. Paul believed in a physical resurrection of the dead. I don't think John rejects this. Paul believed in a physical resurrection. If Paul believes in a physical resurrection, something has to happen, right? Something has to happen to Paul because Jews did not believe in a physical resurrection until the judgment. So if Paul had just seen a vision that has no objective content outside of you know, him mentally seeing something, if Paul sees some sort of uh, appearance like that, he would never conclude physical bodily resurrection. He would say, oh, you know, Jesus appeared to me in a vision. They had no problem with visions. They loved visions. People had visions, right? When you see a vision, uh, has anyone in here ever had a loved one die and then you had some sort of dream or vision or something like that of the, of the, the dead loved one appearing to you? Anyone? Okay, we have a couple, right? Did you conclude that the, the, the coffin was empty? Do you, would you conclude that your coffin is, the coffin is now empty, that the person has been raised physically from the dead? Uh, neither would a first century Jew. A first century Jew, if you see a vision, you've seen a vision. But they all conclude, the apostles and Paul conclude, physical bodily resurrection. What could change their minds about Jesus? Guess what? A vision can't do it. John's saying, oh, they're visionaries. They see visions. Right, if they saw visions, they would have said, wow, God is letting us know that Jesus is okay. Jesus will be resurrected on the last day just like everyone else. They don't conclude that. They conclude physical bodily resurrection. What could change their mind about their entire belief system? What could change them so that they no longer think that the resurrection only occurs at the end but it is started in the person of Jesus? It would have to be something radical, and it would have to be the kind of stories we find in the Gospels with Jesus actually appearing to them saying, here, watch me eat a fish. So we have basic facts. Jesus died. The disciples were convinced that he appeared to them. Uh, not just one, not just one, not just two, but a bunch, over 500, multiple groups of people see him, multiple individuals see him, friends and foes see him. They're willing to go to their bloody, horrible deaths proclaiming this. We can't say they're lying. You can't say it's hallucinations because too many of them see it. You can't say it's legend because it's too early. What explanation do we have? The only way around this is just to say, I'm not going to believe any of it. I'm not going to believe any source. I'm going to throw out all, every, all the evidence we have because it's so long ago. Well, if you do that, yeah, then yes, you would reject the resurrection. If you actually believe that we can know something about history, uh, then we have these facts that are granted a, 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 by scholars across the spectrum, and we can know uh, that these facts only fit one conclusion, and that's that Jesus rose from the dead. So if you reject the resurrection, it's not based on the evidence. It's based on something else. Thank you, David. And now John's second rebuttal. Can I have two rebuttals or do I just get one? Can I have two to his one? This, this will be your day. I know. Um, let's see. Where to begin? <laughs> we don't know that when Paul had his vision that he instantly concluded the tomb was empty. That was an evolutionary trajectory in the early church. Uh, burial traditions uh, and uh, appearance narratives change from gospel to gospel. Mark simply says Jesus was buried in a rock-hewn tomb with a stone rolled against the entrance, whereas Matthew's later gospel says Jesus was buried in his own new tomb. See, it's, it's growing. The story is growing. And the stone in Ma Mark has now become a great stone in Matthew. Luke adds that it was a tomb where no one had yet been laid. 
another addition. And the chief priests, uh, we're told in Matthew, bribed the soldiers to spread a lie around uh, about, about it in order to solidify the fact that, uh, you know, the tomb was actually, you know, there's evidence that the tomb was empty. And the, the guards are proof of that evidence. And the stories that continue to grow. The appearance narratives from none in Mark to clasping Jesus' feet in Matthew, to Luke's Jesus showing his hands and feet. Oh, that's much more evidence. Now we've got him showing hands and feet with nail prints, not just clasping at his feet and not just showing him, but look at my hands, he says, and my feet. As I myself touch me and see a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. The stories are growing incrementally because they're being questioned. And so we've got to have, we've got to, we've got to expand on this story. The disciples are even, uh, even give him a fish to eat in Luke. Not only that, but Jesus speaks about prophecy, which proves what they have just seen and heard. But there's no prophecy, and I can't trust anybody who misinterprets prophecy. I don't care if it's the book of Acts. I don't care if it's Paul. You look at the original prophecies in the Old Testament, and you try to make sense of them as prophecies of Jesus, and you cannot do it. There's not one single sentence in the Old Testament that points to Jesus as a Messiah, as a resurrected, born, incarnate God from, from a virgin that can be interpreted as uh, fulfilled in Jesus. I don't care what the New Testament writers say. They're wrong when they use it that way. And the reason why they went back and started searching for prophecies of Jesus is because the Jews, rational people that they were, they questioned it, the story. And so then the, Jew, the, the Christians, they went back in the Old Testament, they had, to, they had to prove that, no, 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 there's prophecy too. Just like there, the tomb uh, was a great stone and he, he was laid in a, in a really nice uh, um, a new tomb and, and people got to feel his hands. We got, to, we got to produce stories that have more evidence and so we've got to have prophecy too. And they went back in the Old Testament, they found anything they could. But the prophecies aren't there. I know you've been taught all your life otherwise. And if you want to check into that, I've got a chapter in one of my books that I think would enlighten you, if you're interested. And so in the Gospel of John, you, you have a different story. Now you've got Doubting Thomas. Oh, I won't believe until I see. The thing is, that's not evidence. It's a story to us. To us, it's a story. It's a fourth century manuscript of a story. That itself is not evidence. That is in the text. And um, so Downing Thomas says, you know, I want to see my, uh, put my hands into your, your side and stuff like that. And he does it and, and it bleeds. And, and it says, well, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. How many cult groups have you seen say the same thing? Besides, uh, for um, Jesus to walk around and to talk, he had to have blood running through his veins. Because uh, that's what the, you know, the, the lungs, the lungs are used because they've got blood flowing through them. And so for him to breathe, like it says he breathed on them, or, or to eat fish, or to any of those bodily functions, he had to have blood. But, you know, he lost his blood on the cross. There's a lot of things that need to be explained at, rather than explained away. Um, okay, now he mentioned, David mentioned Craig Keener's book, Miracles. It's a two-volume work, and I've read enough about it. I've not read enough of it to, uh, to know it exists. <laughs> Listen. It's one thing, it's one thing to write down verified miracles. Doctor so-and-so says uh, he was, uh, you know, he had diagnosed with an ear infection, he can't hear, and voila, after being touched, he can hear. That's one thing, that's one thing entirely. What Craig Keener did was, it, I should have put it in my new book, under the chapter, When All Else Fails Lie. I'm not, I'm not accusing Craig, Craig Keener of lying, but it's dishonest what he did. All he did is he traveled around and he listened to stories told by people. The person said this, he wrote it down. The person said that, he wrote it down. And he admits that, of course. I guess it's not that uh, dishonest after all. But you can't, you can't believe that. You can't believe just people's stories. Um, otherwise, you're going to go travel in India, travel uh, Africa. I mean, hear their stories. Some of these cultures are superstitious people. And they'll credit to God with a, with a miracle at the drop of a hand. And um, you, you need to be questioning of those sorts of things uh, rather than just write them all down and then and to use it as evidence. You can't use that as evidence. Listen to the stories themselves. I, I have doubts that the resurrection happened, so why would I, why would I doubt that? And I don't doubt everything either. I, I don't doubt your writing. I don't doubt that what you have to say is going to be really good. Uh, but I doubt it. Uh, it's just the same because I'm a radical doubter. <laughs> but um, all right, here's, here's a, 
I don't know if this is a good place to do that. Uh, just ring the buzzer when you want me to stop, and I'll stop. Give me a few seconds, and because you know I've said all I want to say, and I'm just you know wasting space here. You know, I'd rather be a comedian. You know that. <laughs> they can throw tomatoes at me that way, and you know I, I deserve them, I suppose. But here's what Keith Parsons did when he summed up the evidence. We, we have, at best, our second, third, or fourth-hand reports of those uh, experiences of, of the resurrection of Jesus as recounted of, in the Gospels. We, we have, at best, second, third, and fourth-hand reports of those, those experiences of Jesus. <clears throat> There's no reason to think that the Gospel records are particularly reliable. On the contrary, he says, how much confidence can we have in documents, one, written by persons unknown? Can you imagine a court trial of people accusing somebody of something, and who, are, who is this person? I don't know. What's their relationship to the, to the defendant? We don't know. W where they live? We don't know. What's their gender? We don't know. Oh, okay. Put that into the record as reliable testimony. Written by persons unknown about supposed eyewitnesses. That's what, we don't have the eyewitnesses. We have writings about the, suppo the supposed eyewitnesses. Oh, and uh, Richard Bachman's book, uh, Jesus, the evidence, Eyewitness for Jesus, what's that? that? Jesus and the eyewitnesses. Yeah, G Richard Bachman proves that uh, the eyewitnesses were there. Oh, yeah, I yeah, sure did. Yeah, because uh, they all share the same names. I mean, there's, there's lots of Marys and lots of Pauls, lots of Jesuses and lots of Peters. So, therefore, these uh, people really must have existed. I mean, the real uh, 12 disciples and Mary and Magdalene, because that was, those were common names back then. So, therefore, yeah, there must have been, you know, real disciples the, named those people who actually did and said the things they did, something like that. But, you know, the Gospels also record uh, strange events, like um, uh, an earthquake at the time of the death of Jesus and uh, uh, saints coming out of their graves and uh, other kinds of, of sorts of things that I would consider bizarre, but you may not. Okay. Two, composed 40 years or more after the events. Three, based on oral traditions. Four, containing many undeniably fictional uh, elements. Five, each with clear theological bias and apologetic agenda. Six, contradicting many known facts. Seven, inconsistent with each other. Eight, with very little cooperation from non-Christian sources. Nine, testifying to occurrences which in any other context would be re regarded as unlikely in the stream. And he says no, and I say no. Okay, we will switch gears and we're going to enter a 10-minute cross-examination time, pun intended, I guess that's home court advantage, um, for each debater to ask the other debater 60 seconds for the question, 60 seconds for the response, and then we'll switch. 60 seconds for a question, 60 seconds for a response. David, the first question is yours. Oh, we agreed that it was going to be a just crossfire, kind of say whatever you want rather than just uh, ask questions. Okay, then so we will allow one minute uh, for each. Ready? Go ahead. All right, uh, John. I, ha I have one request. Um, if you want to call Just me, one. if you want to call me the worst dirtbag the world has ever seen, Never. I give you permission to do that fully. But please don't say anything about Craig Keener. He, everyone who's ever seen this man speak knows uh, that this is a phenomenal man of integrity. You may disagree okay. with his uh, method of going around for eyewitnesses, but notice what John kept complaining about. Why don't we have the eyewitnesses of the resurrection? Why don't we have the eyewitnesses? Why don't we have the eyewitnesses? Craig Keener says, all right, I'll go around, I'll go around the world collecting data from eyewitnesses. Uh, everyone, who's, everyone who is apparently involved or anywhere near it, I'll ask them all questions. I'll put the reports together. And John says, this is nothing. This is horrible. What an evil person. Uh, very interesting methodology. If, someone, if there's no eyewitness, it, you can dismiss it based on no eyewitness. If you have a ton of eyewitnesses, well, uh, who cares what eyewitnesses say? They're just superstitious, biased people. Uh, and so basically, again, uh, there's just no evidence that could ever convince you out of this level of skepticism. You, you have to be starting with naturalism to say, there are hundreds of millions of people who say they've witnessed miracles. I'm ruling them all out as idiots ahead of time. So the answer to your question is, wait, was that a question? Crossfire, say whatever you want. Oh, you um, I like you. <laughs> yeah, you're a good guy. Uh, no, I, you know, it just seems like to me, I, you know, I, like I said, I only touched the cover of that book and smelled it and kind of put it back on the shelf, but um, it's, not, it's not a way for doing testimony. I mean, there are clearly superstitious people, superstitious people groups that, um, all right, let me, let me just share you, share you some of those stories. I got to get to this quick because I got 60 seconds. Hurry up. Um, all right, I'm not going to get it. 
the world of the Bible is filled with, with uh, all kinds of those stories and uh, incredible stories of snakes that uh, talk, uh, like um, the, uh, where there are gods and goddesses that ruled over specific lands of the earth and met in divine councils to decide our fate. It was a world where the gods and the suns lived in the sky and people who died uh, went to the dark recesses of the earth and people who went to the good place were good. It was a world where snake and donkey talk, where giants lived in the land, where people could live to be more than 900 years old, where a mother was turned into a pillar of salt, where a pillar of fire could lead people by night, where sun stopped moving across the sky or could even back up, where an axe head could float or, or a star could point down a specific home and move, where people could instantly speak on languages. Thank you, John. We'll switch. There are, pe there are people like that. There are people and cultures like that. My time, John. My time. And, now, uh, I, and the people he interviewed... Now, uh, notice, what, notice what John says. While the, the time of the Bible is filled with all these superstitious, well, let's say it correctly, they're, 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 it's, there are people who believe that miraculous things occurred. Uh, guess what? Any, if you get outside of, uh, outside of Europe and America, that's standard, right? That's standard. I mean, we're talking about converts in China, uh, depending on the study, between 50 and 90% of them who convert to Christianity because they believe they've seen a miracle. Um, how do you just say they're all wrong, that they're, that they're all wrong, right? And how do you, well, they're just superstitious. So anyone who says they've seen a miracle is automatically superstitious and is ruled out of court. What evidence could you ever ask for, right? If we all saw a miracle right now, right in front of us, and we all concluded that we'd seen a miracle, oh, suddenly we're irrelevant because we believe in miracles and therefore we're superstitious. John, they're not dumb people, they're Asian. I, normally, you can't say stereotypes, but Asians like that one, so I'm, I'm going to let uh, I'll let it slide. So. Thank, you, thank you, David. John. I, I never I never say I never say that ancient people were stupid, or Asians, or any other grouping of people, or gender, or sexual orientation. I don't say that at all. But I do say that there are some people who are uh, superstitious. Not stupid, just superstitious. They just don't know any better, and a lot of us don't know any better about a lot of different things. And Science came along and helped us. It's not, a, it's not a God, it's not a savior, but it's the best, me best method we know for knowing the truth about the nature of things and which religion is true if there is one. Um, but I didn't get to finish, but the handkerchiefs that could heal people, uh, shadows that could heal people, where a pool was stirred, you jumped in it and you could get healed, where a flood could cover the whole earth, where a man could be swallowed by a great fish and live to tell about it, where a man could walk on water, calm a stormy sea, or change water into wine. It was a world populated by demons that could wreak havoc on the earth and also made People very sick. It was a world of idol worship where human and animal sacrifices pleads God. In this world, we find visions, inspired dreams, prophetic utterances, miracle workers, magicians, and uh, divin diviners and sorcerers. And I need a nurse right now. I'll catch you at your breath. Thank you, John. David. Uh, John. David. All right. John's not saying that uh, you know all the people around the, world, the hundreds of millions of people around the world who uh, who claim to have witnessed uh, miracles are stupid. They're just stu superstitious. Uh, but, but, but think about the situations and think about the actual cases. Um, child stops breathing for hours. Um, Christian prays over the child. Child gets up. Uh, you don't need to be superstitious to think that something has happened there, right? That something supernatural has occurred. The, by the way, the, the, these are the kinds of stories that, uh, that, that the 1,100-page book on miracles uh, is filled with. You either have to say, you can't, you, you, you can't just say they're all superstitious. You have to say a lot of people are lying here because it's not superstitious to say kids not breathing for a couple hours, kids alive now after Christian praise. It doesn't take, uh, it doesn't take uh, superstition to come up with that. That seems like the only, uh, the only possible view of it. And yet, unless, of course, you're uh, committed to rejecting any such evidence. John. I, uh, I say what would convince me uh, uh, to believe. It's in a chapter in my book, uh, Why I Became an Atheist. I don't have the time to read it right now or say it, but I, I do state what would convince me. Uh, things like if uh, the pillar of salt was detected by the Sea of Galilee or Sea of uh, the Red Sea and uh, they could detect uh, human uh, female DNA in it uh, resembling uh, Lot's wife. That kind of stuff, a pillar um, that was uh, built to Abraham saying he was our forefather, et cetera, et cetera, but none of that's there. Um, uh, now, I want to I say this, uh, though, about uh, the miracles, okay? The Catholic Church has officially recognized 67 miracles, a rough estima estimata estimation of the general reliability of human testimony from Lord's France comes out to be point zero 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 one six seven because millions of Catholics claim to have been healed in the same way. But 
the reliability of human testimony for human miracles comes out to that. Now that was investigated by the Catholic Church believers. I would like to investigate those miracle claims myself, but I don't get a chance to do that. So human testimony about miracles is, un, uh, is notoriously unreliable. Craig Keener's thesis is bad. Thank you, John. Impossible. Well, uh, I, I, would, I would invite you to, uh, to, to read it. It's a, a lot of interesting uh, statistics there. And uh, let, let's just say the world is filled with a, a lot of people who convert to religions based on their own lies and then uh, really just love to, to spread lots of lies about them. Uh, but John, I have, a, I have an interesting question. I, I base my entire case for the resurrection of Jesus on the earliest Christian testimony we have, not according to me, according to critical atheist agnostic scholars, and facts that are agreed upon by scholars from across the board. Notice the people I'm quoting, Bart Ehrman, uh, people from the Jesus Seminar, um, people who really, really, really disagree with me a lot. And in response, John, John he says there's discrepancies in the Gospels, which I didn't even use as, as part of my case. I'd love to have a discussion about, uh, about those, but it just has nothing to do with my case. And then the, the only sort of scholarly response is, is polyamorous Richard Carrier, who specializes in ancient Roman science, um, not in historical Jesus studies, Keith Parsons, who's a philosopher, not a, a historical Jesus scholar or a New Testament scholar, Thank you, and David. some anonymous guy who dates the, the, book, the book of Luke to, the, to 140, which I've never heard anyone do. Thanks, David. John? Okay, I, I said I think Jesus probably existed and he probably died. He was, like, he was a failed apocalyptic prophet. That it was, he, he prophesied a doomsday. Doomsday, doomsday, doomsday. It's going to come. It never happened. Um, and um, and I, don't, I deny some of the scholarship. Bart Ehrman says, usually he says something like this. Um, that's what they believed. You know? Now, on the death of Jesus, he'll say, yeah, Jesus died. But on uh, other things, he'll say, yeah, the early church Christians believed he rose from the dead. That's not saying he believes they raised from the, you know, Jesus raised from the dead, only that they, they believed that. That doesn't make me want to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Think, think about the ending of Mark. Okay, I'm, I'm there, I come up to the tomb, and there's two people in the white, very first recorded gospel, and uh, two people in white say, that's what it says, that's the angels. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong on that. I, a long time since I've started memor stopped memorizing scripture, and that's why I call it some days, but um, he is risen. Oh yeah, I'm convinced now, see? Thank no, you. That, no, no, Thank you, I John, can't. appreciate it. David. I still have no idea why he's going to the Gospel of Mark at all. I'm quoting material from decades earlier, right? We're not talking about something written decades after, right? We have a creed that according to scholars across the spectrum, is our earliest Christian material. Now, it, now John's saying, oh, but you know, things are from the fourth okay, century and right. so on. I say, I say, fine, I'll go to the earliest material we have. And then okay. again, people like Ehrman and so, they're not saying, yeah, it's probably true. There's, they're, they're, things like historically certain, those are their phrases that they're using with this material. So, uh, you, I mean, just think, if I say, here's my case, fact, 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 agreed upon across the board, resurrection's only explanation, and you say, let me attack this different thing that you didn't bring up. Well, that's not an answer, is it? So we get to the end of the debate, and there's just no response to anything I've laid out in my opening statement. And uh, this, it, 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 if this is scored as a debate, that all matters, ladies and gentlemen. All right, that one, you got me on that one. Um, I, responded to a different, I responded to a different question than, than you asked. But First Corinthians 15, uh, it recounts the stories of uh, people who uh, were convinced that Jesus rose from the dead, and it is the earliest one. The, the thing is, Paul denies, we have a dispute in Galatians, because Paul says, I deny having received this from men, and you said chapter 2, he says, well, he, he, you know, he, he did you know, associate with these guys, but in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, he, he uses a very strong language in, in the Greek that says that, no, I, this, I did not receive these doctrines. I forget how it's worded exactly. Th these things, I did not receive any official teaching. That's the, the import of that, uh, uh, about these things. Just like he heard the, uh, the, the, the story of the Lord's Supper by a revelation, then why can't he have heard the story of Jesus' resurrection by a revelation as well? Uh, what, we're, what we're asking ourselves is, uh, two things. One, um, what, did he, what did he see? What did they see? And it appears to me they saw visions. They were visionaries. So that doesn't mean I should believe that they, they, they saw anything at all. Uh, and two, um, did they all tell the same stories? I have no way of questioning them. Did, did, Thank you, John. We appreciate it. Um, 
round of uh, applause for a difficult section there. Thank you for our two years debate. Now we'll have five-minute closing statements uh, from each side. Uh, David will go first. Well, thanks again to Reston Bible Church and for John um, uh, representing the atheist position. Uh, I've presented facts and I've shown that, that these facts are, are not disputed. Um, it's based on material that's not disputed as being very early. John, the only thing I've, I've detected as an actual attempt to explain the facts uh, is John's claim that these were visionary appearances and therefore it wasn't something that, uh, that anyone, it, it wasn't Jesus actually appearing to them at some sort of, um, of vision. Uh, let me just go ahead and quote something here. Um, this is from Gary Sibsey. Uh, who is a psychologist at Piedmont uh, Psychiatric Center. He writes, I have surveyed the professional literature, peer-reviewed journal articles and books written by psychologists, psychiatrists, and other relevant healthcare professionals during the past two decades and have yet to find a single documented case of a group hallucination. That is, an event for which more than one person purportedly shared in a visual or other sensory perception where there was clearly no external referent. Uh, so, group hallucinations would be extremely rare, right? Because if you're, if you're hallucinating, there's nothing out there. You, other people will not see it. Uh, there, there are apparently phenomena where a bunch of people can be hallucinating at the same time, but these are people who, uh, who are all expecting things and not everyone sees it, right? They're, they're independent hallucinations, in other words. Maybe they're seeing some person that they want to see. The disciples were distraught. The disciples, they were done, right? Their work was done. Their guy died. If your guy, if your Messiah died, you went and got a new Messiah. That's it. They've been wasting all of these years. They're not in the state of mind. They're not in the state of mind to have these hallucinations that, that are fueled by expectation of seeing someone. And even if we did think that suddenly group hallucinations were incredibly uh, popular in the first century among uh, Jesus followers. Uh, what do you do with James? What do you do with Paul? They're certainly not expecting Jesus to appear to them. So you need one very odd uh, theory upon another. You need theory upon theory upon theory upon theory to account for every little bit of piece of evidence we have. And is there a limit to the absurdity involved? When everything we know tells us that's not the sort of thing that happens, I mean, think, that's the rule that people are applying to the resurrection. Well, the resurrection's not sort of thing that happens. Well, multiple repeated group appearances, that doesn't happen. So, so what's going on here? Uh, but notice there's a difference. We know that these things don't happen. Uh, you can't just say resurrections don't happen, right? You, you can't say that without presupposing naturalism, and that's what we simply cannot presuppose. Um, so group hallucinations would be extremely rare, and uh, uh, so the only, the only explanation we've had tonight for the actual facts that I presented uh, just fails. And notice, you could explain anything if you, wanted, if you wanted to say, hey, repeated group hallucinations uh, can be used to explain what lots of people, friends and foes, in, uh, as individuals and in small groups and in a large group, uh, all claim to have seen and are willing to go to their death proclaiming. You could explain this debate tonight. Do we have a debate? No, it's all, everyone just hallucinated the same thing. You could explain anything in history that way. So if you have to resort to this sort of method, uh, can you really say, as John did, I want to believe? I'm looking for a reason to believe. I don't think so. So uh, tonight, I've shown that Jesus died by crucifixion, that his, uh, that, that his friends and foes became convinced that he had appeared to them, that it was belief in bodily resurrection. So this can't be a vision. If it's a vision, they would conclude they had a vision. They would say, hey, I had a vision of Jesus. He's appeared to me from heaven. They would have never said resurrection. Paul, a Shamite Pharisee, would never have concluded resurrection. It went against everything he believed. Something big had to happen to shake all of these men into the belief that not only had they seen Jesus in a vision, they had seen him resurrected. He was now resurrected. What could do that? Well, resurrection can do that. Hallucination and visions just can't do that. There's just no way. Um, so as far as what John has re re replied as well, we can't know thing much about history. There are discrepancies in the gospels, um, even though my case hasn't been based on them at all. Uh, stories are growing incrementally, even though I, I, I pointed out you can put the gospels in any order you want and you can show that they're, that they're evolving stories by just because some of them include more detail. Uh, and my case was based on material much earlier than the Gospels. So 
Keep in mind, the most appearances you ever have in any story are in our earliest source. If that's evolution, it's going in reverse. So it seems like this debate comes down to what sort of explanation would you prefer? Would you prefer a supernatural explanation that fits all the facts, fits them well, and is the only explanation that actually fits the facts, but which will lead to certain theological commitments on your part? Or would you prefer a natural explanation that doesn't fit the facts, that is completely refuted by the facts and can never account for the facts? Uh, that's the difference you have here tonight. And now John's five-minute closing statement. Yeah, I, I, you can, what, what do you do when you picture uh, somebody having a vision? Uh, do they picture these people naked? Do, do they picture these people uh, floating through the sky? They, they have visions of people fully clothed, bodily visions. So it's not, it's not really, uh, you know, beyond the, the scope that these visions were of bodily of a bodily Jesus initially that grew incrementally as I've shown in um, you know through the from the rock stories and from the appearance stories up until we grasped his hands and put his fingers through his you know nail nails and holes in his hands and hugged him and, and said we're told by um, um, uh, Jesus you know blessed is he who, who believes even though he doesn't see it, it grows from those initial stories is what I, I claim um, and I think the, the, the evidence is there. The bottom line is that in my world, miracles do not happen. What world are apologists like David uh, Wood and Mike Lacona and William Lane Craig living in? The odds of a resurrection from my experience are zero. I must judge the past from the present knowledge I have. God may have done a plethora of miracles in the past, and he may do another plethora of miracles in the future, but in my world, miracles don't happen. God could do that. Craig Keener could actually document that, but they don't happen. Um, and, and I have better critical f facilities about that. I'm sorry. I, I wish they did happen in a way. It, they just don't. You know, it, they just don't. Um, I mean, if they did, then, you know, let's just have one. You know, let's, let's have one. I mean, and, and the standard one is uh, take uh, somebody whose leg has been amputated and have it grow uh, back in front of us. But no God, no, God does things mysteriously. He does things different. He does things under a cloud of mystery, and only the believers can actually see that sort of stuff. And that would be testing him too much. We don't want to do that. Um, so I can't really reasonably do otherwise. Um, so let me just read you from Bart Ehrman, since he's been bandied about a little bit today, uh, and says, all historians can do is show what prob probably happened. That's the, prob that's the problem with miracles. Miracles, by our very definition of the term, are virtually impossible events. So miracles, by their very nature, are always the least probable explanations for what happened. Suppose that Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea and then a couple of Jesus' followers, not among the 12, decided that night to move the body somewhere more appropriate. And, upon, and they, they encountered a couple of Roman legionnaires who catch these followers with this dead body and in the process they end up killing them uh, that, because they suspect foul play. And so now the soldiers are, um, they have three bodies on their hand, they don't know which one was being carried and so they decide to um, just uh, get, get rid of them, you know, take a cart and cart these three courses off to the, the valley of the grave uh, uh, yard and dump them. And then within three or four minutes, the, die, the bodies have deteriorated beyond recognition. Jesus' original tomb is empty and no one seems to know why. Now, is this scenario likely, Bart Ehrman says? No, it's not likely at all. Am I proposing that this is what happened? No, he says, absolutely not. I'm not proposing that this is what happened. Is it more probable that something like this may have happened than that a miracle happened and Jesus left the tomb to ascend into a heaven? Absolutely, he says. From, my, from a purely historical point of view, a highly unlikely improbable event is far more probable than a virtually impossible one. And with that, I end. Thank you so much. So thanks to both our debaters. A uh, final round of applause for both of them for their excellent debate tonight. Uh, for the, we're going to enter a 15-minute audience question and answer session. We're probably only going to have time for, I would imagine, four questions totals, and we need to alternate between the two. Um, whoever asked the question, 
um, of whomever the question is asked, they will have two minutes to respond. The other person will have one minute to comment, and then we'll go the question to the next person. The microphone's here, so if you want to start lining up there, uh, and if there are many of you, maybe you can get together and decide what the best question would be to pose. Um, While that's happening, I would like to uh, not only thank our debaters, but thank Reston Bible Church, also thank um, Nat Sears and Will Gaines for sponsoring this debate. Uh, Will Gaines and his class Faith and, Faith and Reason meet here at Reston Bible. And if you are interested in these kinds of questions, we have a class here at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings called Solid Ground. Uh, in it, we have Christians, atheists, agnostics, skeptics. Uh, Dennis, who I think, there's Dennis right here, is uh, one of our favorite atheists in the class, if you're allowed to rank order them uh, by order of priority. Um, and I'm sure he would like some extra company as well. Uh, but we would encourage you to come. It's in the room upstairs, 250, at 9 o'clock on Sundays. And we'd love to have you there and love to hear your perspective. Um, now we'll go to the question and answer time. Uh, the first question, for whom is your first question? I think I'll, I'll go to David. Okay. First question is for David. We'll have two minutes, and then John, you'll have one minute to comment on that one. Just, uh, this was something that, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I blurted it out earlier, but I still want to hear your answer. Um, you were saying how you, you respect textual criticism and, the, and, and so forth, and that nothing that you said would be affected by the textual criticism. However, in, in an earlier part, and I recognize you weren't, you're speaking mainly about um, 1 Corinthians, not about Mark, but in the part that, where you did actually respond to something in Mark about there being no resurrection appearances in Mark, you, have, you quoted from the part which is uh, disputed, which most scholars would say is not part of the original gospel of Mark. And then um, the other thing is you say that the, uh, that the uh, 1 Corinthians 15 is dated from only a couple of uh, years after the uh, uh, crucifixion. But it would be hard for Paul to have had his full Mediterranean ministry and then... Uh, write the epistle with only, only a few years. And can you and ask so us the, your question, please? So I have, I have two things. One, uh, explain how the, what the evidence is that it is, that that quote is early rather than something that's relatively recent at the time of Paul's writing. And two, uh, explain why you um, choose to discard textual criticism for the ending of Mark, but uh, still uh, hold on to it for other things. Thank you. Um, as far as Mark, I didn't. No, I didn't. Um, uh, textual critics in the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 16, verse 8, I quoted, I think, verse 6. So I didn't quote anything from after verse Okay, I'm sorry. I, from, I missed. From after verse 8. No, that's fine. That's, that's fine. This happens. Um, uh, as far as 1 Corinthians 15, it's actually a, a, much, a much longer um, discussion, but Paul uses the language of giving and receiving oral tradition. Um, Paul, as a Pharisee, uh, is obsessed with tradition, right? That's what the Pharisees were famous. You, you, you had the tradition of the rabbis and you pass it down. And whoever uh, you know, is most zealous for, for uh, affirming and, and quoting these traditions is, uh, is sort of the, the awesomest Pharisee. And, uh, and that's why Paul in Galatians says that he was, uh, he was uh, advancing beyond many of his countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when Paul becomes a Christian, he doesn't change his love of tradition. He just, uh, he, he changes the source, right? It's no longer being passed down by the rabbis. It goes to the apostles. And that's why even in, uh, even in Galatians, uh, which John says rules out the Apostle Paul getting anything from anyone else, what does he do with his gospel? He says he goes to the apostles in Jerusalem, talks to them in private to make sure that after 17 years of preaching, he hasn't been running in vain. So Paul, after 17 years of preaching, is willing to go in there and say, am I right about this? Because if you guys say I'm wrong, I'm in trouble. Um, so that's Paul's respect for tradition. And in 1 Corinthians 15, he uses the language um, of gi giving and receive, receiving and giving, um, oral tradition. So what I received, I passed on to you. Uh, and then, and, and by the way, anyone, any teacher has ever graded papers and you can spot, you know, when someone is, is, is uh, uh, plagiarizing, um, is plagiarizing Wikipedia. Uh, I have this students and all of a sudden, uh, hey, this doesn't sound like you writing anymore. Um, anyone who's experienced that, um, and then I just Google the, the, the part that sounds different and I found out it comes from uh, Wikipedia and then someone gets called 
to the office. Um, but you can, this is not, this is not Pauline. Uh, the language is not Paul's. Paul does not speak this way. Thank you, David. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, John. Talk afterwards. Go more detail. Uh, the thought just occurred to me. I like having new thoughts. Uh, I throw them out. I throw them out. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're not. And uh, here's a thought. Um, uh, not, not that the disciples stole the body or um, that there, he swooned on the cross. You deal with that effectively, I think. Um, but what if Paul lied? Now, you, 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 um, you would object to that outright, wouldn't you? Because you regard him as, a, as, a, as an inspired author. Um, but what if he just lied? It never occurred to me just till now. Maybe, I'm, maybe I'm, I'm sure I'm off the wall. We don't know Paul. You, you, you know, we're, we're reading documents, ancient documents, and Paul says, you know what? I came and checked my story out with the, with the early disciples or what have you. I never, first, I, first of all, he says, I never received this from man. And then he preached it for 17 years. And he says, hey, and I went to Jerusalem, and they confirmed I was preaching the right stuff. Really? Thank you, John. We appreciate it. Thank you. More believable than a resurrection. Uh, question for John. Yeah, and I'd like to thank both of you for speaking with us tonight. I was a history major in college and a philosophy minor, so your perspectives were very interesting. Um, my question for you, John, is when you were a Christian, specifically a seminarian and a pastor, why were you convinced that the gospel was true during that period in your life? Why was I convinced that the gospel was? Was true. Why was I convinced that the gospel was true? Because <clears throat> I read C.S. Lewis. I read Josh McDowell. I read... Um, um, Francis Schaeffer, and the Bible, because the Bible wasn't good enough. You had to read more than that, you know. Um, and, um, yeah, I was convinced because of a really dramatic experience. I, uh, you know, experiences like a Damascus Road type of thing. And uh, I was raised to be a believer, and then I fell away, you know, 17-year-old, 18-year-old, 19-year-old, ask him about his falling away. Whoo, he's got the story to tell you, I'll tell you that. But he had a dramatic story just like I do. I mean, his was more dramatic if you want to compare stories. Uh, and um, I didn't know any better. I didn't know any better. I just didn't know any better. I, 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 you know, people will grasp on the stories and believe them because they offer hope over truth any day. I did. Then I studied my, my faith out, and uh, I eventually came to uh, reject it. It was wrong. It may have saved me from jail <laughs> back in those days, but... Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 grasped it, uh, I grasped onto it because of the hope it offered rather than the truth and the evidence that it was there. All right. Um, oh, and by, by John mentioned my, my story. You're going to type in David Wood, uh, why I'm a Christian, into uh, YouTube. Where I, you I want to get smacked because, in the head with some solid because, truth. Yeah, because, uh, because people kept asking me about it, so I put it up there. Uh, in fact, John was one of the ones who asked me about it. Hey, well, how did, what was your life like as an atheist? All right, I'll tell you. Um, but... John says he believed, and then he, he didn't believe, and he, he came to doubt. But, but notice, notice the, the shift that has occurred. At, at some point, he, comes, he adopts the methodology, the odds of a resurrection in my world are zero. That's what he said. And if the odds are, are zero, then, then, yeah, no amount of testimony could ever show you that, uh, that any miracle has occurred. And notice, if God appeared right now and started striking lightning bolts around, the odds of that are zero ahead of time. So there's, there's just no evidence that, that will ever convince us. Thank you. A uh, question for David. Hi, I'm Dennis. I'm uh, Scott's favorite atheist. We know uh, who you are. <laughs> uh, I, like John, am an ex-Christian uh, who is now an atheist, although I'm told by many Christians that I couldn't possibly have been a Christian if I'm now an atheist. Uh, and my answer to these people is every, everyone in this room is an atheist. John and I just go one God further. But this question really is for both. Neither one of you won this debate. Neither one of you. You didn't change a single mind. For Dennis, this for uh, 10 years. If we, we do need a question. Okay. Maybe there's a compromise between you two. This is a question for both of you. Isn't it possible that maybe there wasn't a physical bodily resurrection, but maybe there was a, not a vision, but a spiritual resurrection? That, every, that people believe that the spirit of Jesus was raised and ascended into heaven. Did it, did it have to go through a body? That's my question. You said it's both of us, so you want to go first I'll, I'll, second? Since you've been taking uh, them first for a while, I'll take this one first. Okay. Um, you know, there are Christian scholars that say that uh, it wasn't a bodily resurrection, it was a vision. And other Christian scholars say, well, it wasn't a bodily re resurrection, it wasn't a vision, it was uh, a, a, an event. 
<laughs> um, you know, some kind of Easter, they call it the Easter event, left it, leave it, leaving it unspecified, you know. Um, well, listen, what happens if people change their minds about something, you know? Um, people will choose to believe based on hope. That's all there is to it. And um, um, something may have triggered uh, that. All it takes usually is one person, an influential person who says, you know what? I feel Jesus right now. Yeah, you know, I do too. And the candles are lit and it's dark and there's some music and the bongo drums. Yeah, I think I hear him talking to me. No, what's he saying? He's saying, I love you, which he would never say he hates you, of course. Um, and what else is he saying? Uh, he says he's still alive. I think I hear that too. And so the hope is arisen and uh, it could have happened that way. You know, it could have happened that way. But um, why should I accept that? Why, why should I go with that? I mean, that's, if that's all the evidence, screw it. Um, I didn't say this during the debate, but um, as far as the overall position that John adopts, that, uh, that these were visionary appearances and uh, that this gave the disciples their belief, um, I believe that this is the strongest alternative to the resurrection. That doesn't mean I think it's good at all. I think it's better than all the competitors. And the reason is it doesn't force you to deny known indisputed fa undisputable facts of history. Um, so for instance, Islam denies Jesus' death. Jesus doesn't die. Well, that, if we know anything about Jesus, we know, he, we, we know that he died. Um, other, if you, you know, other theories might deny that there were appearances. So if you say that it developed through legend or something like that, there were no appearances of the apostles. This just was some story that someone invented later on. Um, so as far as the vision hypothesis, you can acknowledge that Jesus died, and you can acknowledge that the disciples were completely convinced that Jesus had appeared to them. Uh, so you can acknowledge those main facts, but then you, you can just say, well it, well, it happened by vision. Now the problem is there's, there's another fact involved, and that is that the disciples were not preaching that they had seen vision. Again, they loved vision. They had, Paul goes on receiving visions, but in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, and last of all, he appears to me, he appeared to me also. So this is the final one, right? This is the final one. Well, if it's just visions, Paul continued having visions. Other Christians continued having visions. There are Christians who have visions today. So if Paul is saying there is this limited class of appearances that only happen with certain people, what are they? Well, he tells us. He tells us in, in passages like uh, Romans 8.11 and uh, Philippians 3.20-21, 20 to 21, where he talks about raising Jesus bodily. Jesus, we will be raised bodily the way Jesus was raised bodily. So if the apostles are claiming resurrection, we hear resurrection and we think it means the same thing as you know, just some sort of exist, you know, otherworldly existence or something. Resurrection is physical and bodily. It is the raising of the physical body uh, to a supernatural state. Thank since you, this is what they're claiming, something big happened to convince them that that, 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 that was Jesus appearing to them physically. Thank you. Um, your question is for... Mr. Loftus. And is your question for David? Then these will be our two last questions. Good. Okay. Uh, so, Mr. Loftus, my question is, uh, you say that um, the best that we have uh, in terms of accounts of the resurrection are second, third, fourth-hand accounts at best, and you say, where are the eyewitnesses? Where is the corroborative evidence? But then you say, eyewitness testimony is so unreliable. So why spend so much time harping on the lack of eyewitness testimony if you're just going to say it's unreliable if you get it? Well, you, I said that you need an overwhelming amount of, of non-controversial evidence to overcome the concrete experience that we have that people don't get up from the dead, okay? Uh, eyewitness testimony is valuable, but we need a lot of it. If I said I levitated this morning, you know, while I was preparing for this debate, you wouldn't believe me. If I, if I said David saw me levitate, eh, maybe a little more credibility. If you said you saw me levitate, a little, eh, what? Are they all crazy or what? What if it was on video, camera? Well, all of a sudden, you need that kind of evidence. Because eyewitness testimony is really unreliable. It really is. There have been studies shown uh, in court cases. Someone points out, he did. Yes, he's the murderer. And shown up later that... Uh, they were wrong. They just had this idea of a particular kind of person that might have done this kind of deed, and they pointed out that kind of guy, and without the, the DNA evidence that lets them off the hook 20 years later, because now we've got that, they were, they were wrong in seeing it. So eyewitness testimony is unreliable, uh, uh, but, you, uh, but you need a lot of it when it comes to uh, an extraordinary event like someone rising from the dead. Does that satisfy your question? Almost. So then my small follow-up question to that is, so is 200 million not quite there yet? 
Like in China? Like he mentioned 200 million people who said yeah. that? Well, I read to you a little paragraph about the world of the Bible. You know, hand, handkerchiefs, or, yeah, uh, handkerchiefs healing people and, and shadows and pools that are stirred. There are cultures like that. They, they, they don't have doctors. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to belittle any culture that I'm not aware of. But uh, in the ancient culture, especially, they didn't have the modern medicine, and they, they went to shamans, and, uh, you know, they, they, they offered prayers and, you know, anklets and, you know, I don't know what else to, to try to heal people. And if they got, if they got healed, then they, they credited their God with doing the healing. Um, and I would suspect, I suspect China is like that. Thank you, John. Uh, yeah, John says we need an, an overwhelming amount of evidence, but uh, you know I, I think you're exactly right. There is no there is no amount of evidence that could because what happened the, the the probability of a resurrection or a miracle is zero in John's world. So no amount of evidence can if you start with a probability. This is Bayesianism right here, but uh, if you're starting with a with a prior probability of zero, no amount of evidence can ever can ever change that. Um, he says I, eyewitness testimony is valuable, but we need a lot of it. And, and you, you're exactly right. Hundreds of millions of cases is not enough. Uh, if we're dealing with the apostles, I mean, think about that. Eyewitness testimony. He he, he pointed out, you know, uh, court appearances. Uh, yes, eyewitnesses can get a lot wrong in little details, um, but in things like, hey, there are over 500 of us. We're all seeing this guy alive after his death. That's not some little detail where you know you saw a blue car and I saw a green car, right? That, like like in a court appearance. Uh, so, if we're, I mean, if we're talking about the evidence here, this is, this is a lot of evidence, and you, you, you have to raise your, your bar of skepticism almost to the roof uh, if you want to deny this sort of thing. Hi, this question's for David. Um, just to give you a background, I'm a little bit more on John's side. I'm a member of the Clergy Project, and I feel uh, that I have to give you some points, uh, and no offense to John, I think that your communication skills and your rhetoric were very strong. Um, Who's and, better looking? And definitely you are better looking, <laughs> but he does have a better hat. Um, oh, w a couple things that, that really stuck out with me in listening to you was your... Could you phrase your... Uh, yes, your repetition... Here's a form of a question, please. Your repetition of the... Um, idea that you're stating multiple facts, but you're talking about one passage in 1 Corinthians from a Christian source over and over again, and you're saying that these people, the, the, um, the disciples were the martyrs, the, the true believers who went out and died for their faith. What about true believers of other uh, faiths, of other beliefs? There are lots of martyrs in the world today and how how do you compare that and 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 look at that and say that yours is better thank you uh, well I'd, I'd have to see some specific cases uh, if I look around the world and I see there are Christians who are being martyred and it's uh, it's happening happening pretty regularly uh, thanks to uh, you know our ISIS um, but I don't look at a Christian martyr and say you see there's evidence for Christianity um, just like I don't see, you know, an, an ISIS suicide bomber and say, oh, there's evidence for Islam. Uh, the point of the martyrdom is it's, it shows the sincerity of belief, right? When a Christian dies today for Christianity, all I can say is this person really believes in Christianity. When a Muslim dies for Islam, uh, all I can say is that person really believes in Islam. So I brought up the martyrdom, uh, the torture, the imprisonments, and so on of the apostles just to, to, to respond to the idea that these guys are making it up or that you know, they have some sort of loose, foggy belief that some shady appearance has appeared to them or something like this. They had uh, an amazing degree of confidence to, to go to that level. And the difference is the disciples aren't getting this from some message, right? If I go out and die for what I believe, it's because I heard something, right? I heard a message, I believed it, I believe there's evidence for it, I go out and die for it. The disciples were enduring persecution for something they saw. So that leads me to the question, what did these people see? What did they see with their eyes? I can't say they're lying, right? If, 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 they, if, they're, if they're dying for it, they believe their message. But their message is, we saw this guy alive from the dead. That was the core, the heart of their message. Um, so I have, to believe, I, I have to believe these guys saw something, and guess what? 
scholars across the board agree with me. So we're all acknowledging these guys saw something. What did they see? Well, hallucinations, vision, that sort of thing can't account for it. So what did they see? Uh, and if, if you're ruling out miraculous explanations or something, yeah, you're going to have to say, well, whatever it was, it wasn't a resurrection, so they must have seen something else. Uh, but if you're not opposed to that, then we, you've got a miracle on your hands, and, that, and that's what would explain it. As far as the uh, First Corinthians passage, I quoted that just because it's the earliest and the best, and that's what, that's what scholars, Christian, uh, Christian atheist scholars, everyone points out. So I pointed that because it's the earliest. You have, we have bunches of, of other sources, both in the Bible and, and outside the Bible, and so there, there, you, there are plenty, but that's the earliest and best, so that's what I went with. Is this the last time? The last 60 seconds? I get the last 60 seconds. Well, I just want to thank the church and the organizers for this uh, wonderful time. Um, and it's uh, an honor to be here. And you're a remarkable church to invite me uh, in to debate a central tenet of your faith. You certainly are committed to uh, educating your people and uh, in the search for the truth. And um, I hope I was uh, a helpful uh, participant in that. I, I think I've said everything I want to say anyway. <laughs> so. yeah, Sean. And one final round of applause for our debaters for the job they did tonight. If this was interesting to you, we will see you Sunday at 9 o'clock to continue discussing these kinds of things. Thank you for coming tonight, and we appreciate you being here.